Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's transmission service and market scheduling priorities uh, stakeholder call for the phase two straw proposal. My name is Isabella Nicosia, representing ISO Stakeholder Affairs, and I'll be facilitating the meeting today. Um, the presentation and paper that we will be discussing today is available out on the initiative webpage, and you can get to that page by going to kaiso.com. And then under the Stay Informed tab, you'll want to click on Policy Initiatives and then navigate down to the Transmission Service and Market Scheduling Priorities Phase 2 page. And you'll see it right as the top activity on that page. So before we get started, I'm just going to go through a couple of reminders and housekeeping items. So this call is being recorded for informational and convenience purposes only. Any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. Uh, these calls are structured to stimulate open dialogue and engage different perspectives with the understanding that stakeholders have reviewed the material. Um, and then in the interest of time today, we do have a lot of material to get through um, and we have until 4 p.m. to do so. So please refrain from repeating or reiterating what has already been said. Um, and then if you need technical assist assistance anytime during the meeting today, you can send a chat to the event producer. Her name is Michelle. Um, and then we will be taking questions throughout the call today. If you connected to audio through your computer or used the call me option on WebEx, you can raise, uh, use the raise hand feature located just above the chat window to the right. Um, but if you connected to audio outside of the WebEx, you'll need to press pound two to enter the question queue. Uh, and then just a reminder for everyone to please start by stating your name and affiliation before making your comment. And then you can also put your question in the chat and address it to either myself, again, my name's Isabella, or you can uh, send it to all panelists. So the agenda for today, I'm gonna kick us off by just going through the stakeholder process, and then I'll hand it over to Milos for the initiative background and overview, and then we'll get into the uh, items related to the proposal. So we have calculating ATC and native load needs, accessing ATC, and then establishing long-term uh, wheeling through priority, the studies and expansions related to that item, uh, and then we'll wrap up with the compensation framework for wheeling through scheduling priority, and then go through some next steps. So here we are with the policy initiative stakeholder process. Uh, we are here under the proposal development at the straw proposal for phase two. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Milos Bozanek, our uh, regional market sector manager from market and infrastructure policy. Milos. Thank you, Isabella. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for joining us. I know it's been a, a long time coming where we re-engage on this particular topic and, uh, you know, we're, we're eager to kind of share and discuss the initial design here and, and uh, obtain your feedback and input. Uh, what we're looking to do through this initiative is really design a durable framework that can evolve over time for establishing wheeling through priorities across uh, the ISO system. We're really looking to unlock grid capacity and improve operational coordination uh, in California and across the West. And as you know, there's a number of other efforts and as well as transmission expansion efforts uh, uh, across the West that will support interregional trades and benefit everybody, uh, everyone across, to, in the effort of benefiting uh, entities across the West. So this is uh, one way of unlocking some potential capacity and, and getting a sense of uh, is there and, and how to derive some of the ATC across the ISO system for wheel throughs, but recognizing that there's other efforts across the West as well that are trying to do the same, and there's expansion efforts as well that I think are looking to improve that uh, coordination and uh, ability to trade between uh, Western entities. Um, I know that this is an important issue and, and we acknowledge that for both California LSEs as well as external load serving entities that depend upon uh, wheel through, wheels through the ISO system to reliably serve load. And we really hope that today is the start of a dialogue uh, that, uh, that really allows us to work together towards shaping this design. The design that we're gonna walk through today is an initial design and there's it's malleable. Well, we'll highlight that as we go through the different components of the, uh, of the design, and we really want to get your feedback, whether it's today, whether it's in writing, uh, but you'll see us walk through um, our initial thinking on this, and we certainly would appreciate to hear from you. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that this is new to us. This is new to the ISO. As you know, today we, uh, we don't calculate um, ATC in, as 
in, in an advanced horizon as far as we're looking to do across the 13-month horizon. And consequently, we also don't uh, identify or try to carve out or identify the amount of transmission capacity that's needed for native load. And so uh, you'll see us walk through some different approaches that we're considering as to how that could be done. We appreciate your feedback. We recognize there's variability or uh, variations to the approaches that we put forward, and we certainly want to hear from you and, and again, shape that together. Uh, and, and we're certainly open to providing additional data on a number of uh, different analyses that, that I think can illuminate as, as to how do we best calculate and, and most reasonably calculate these native load needs that provide adequate protections for native load, but at the same time provide access uh, to our grid for wheel throughs. So we look forward to working with you uh, throughout this process. As Isabella said, we have about three hours today, fairly dense material, but I'll try to move us along and make sure that we dedicate uh, sufficient time to each one of the topics. I've already received some requests that we dedicate enough time at the end as well to talk about the compensation framework that we've put forward as well. So that's of interest to stakeholders as well, and, and we'll make sure that we dedicate uh, some time to that as well. But uh, by all means, before stakeholder comments are due, feel free to reach out to us, uh, engage with us. If there are certain clarifications that we can provide, certain um, information, or you want to share some ideas or perspectives, we're certainly open to doing that. So with some of those introductory remarks, uh, let's start with uh, going into the materials. And as we go through the different stages, if you can stay just on slide six for a second, um, as we go through the different slides and, and different components of this design, uh, I have Guillermo with me who's going to walk through some of the data. Uh, we have uh, the OD team who's uh, our consultant that we've hired to help us with a number of aspects of this design that they're available as well for certain uh, elements that I may uh, defer to them. Uh, and then we also, we'll also talk a bit about uh, other components of the design and we'll have other folks from our team jump on and, and discuss those slides with you. So um, feel free to ask questions as we go throughout this. But, just a little bit of background, and I mentioned some of this already, but again, the goal here is really to develop a, a durable framework for establishing wheeling through priorities across our system. A framework that we can also evolve over time and move away from the interim framework that's currently in place. As you see on that second bullet, and, and just as a bit of a reminder, uh, going back, that, back last year, but FERC approved an interim framework for these wheeling through scheduling priorities across our system, and that framework, that interim framework was extended to June 1 of 2024. And so that's really the impetus for us trying to design something that's more durable um, and uh, that can evolve over time so that we can move from an interim approach to something that can be malleable um, and, and that we can continue to design together and improve uh, as we gain experience. But a bit more background that just to level set us, the wheeling through scheduling priorities in the market today, uh, there's a priority wheeling through transactions that have uh, equal priority to load, so, and, and we'll talk on the next slide um, how that priority is established, but we have high priority wheels or these priority wheel throughs that have equal priority to load, and then we also have today non-priority wheel through transactions. These are lower priority transactions uh, than the high priority wheels and lower priority than, than load as well. So uh, if we can go on to the next slide, and Isabella, I'm on my screen, I'm seeing kind of now a smaller slide that it looks like I, I see your screen and, 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 and a slide, but I don't know if it's just my, my screen or, or others uh, as well, just FYI. I'll, I'll keep going, but uh, I see kind of two, 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 uh, two screens. Um, so in terms of the current interim wheeling through scheduling priorities, as I noted, these are interim in nature that expire in June of 2024. We had that extended for a couple of years to give us time to work together to design a more durable framework. And under this interim framework today, the um, wheeling through priorities, if, if an entity wants to establish wheeling through priority that's equal to load, that high wheeling through priority, they have to meet certain requirements at least 45 days ahead of the month uh, of flow. And that they have to demonstrate a firm power supply uh, contract to serve external load. And then they also, that entity has to demonstrate uh, firm transmission to the ISO system for the entire month. Um, and, and again, those requirements have to be met 45 days in advance, and if they're met 45 days in advance, then the entity has wheeling through priority for that particular month that they sought. And so anytime that wheel through is scheduled, it has that 
higher priority to the extent that we are in a situation where those priorities are triggered uh, as well. Uh, we also have uh, lower priority, as I mentioned, wheeling through transactions, that if those do not meet the requirements I just noted above, if they don't meet the requirements 45 days in advance to demonstrate a contract, demonstrate firm transmission for the month, then they have a lower priority and they can continue to wheel through our system, but just having a lower priority uh, than those high priority wheels and, and lower priority than lows. So if we go on to the next slide. Okay, so in these next couple of slides, we're gonna do an overview of the proposed design. And then what we're going to do is uh, walk through each one of these elements separately. There's a, we have separate sections of the, of the slides that go into more depth into each one of these components of the design. Uh, so as, as part of the overview, what we're proposing is to calculate uh, what's called available transfer capability or ATC across the ISO inner tides uh, that would be then accessible to wheeling through transactions to establish scheduling priority. Those wheeling through transactions that access that ATC and are able to reserve it, they would then establish equal priority to load for that period for which they have reserved that, that uh, priority or that ATC. Uh, and to the extent that wheel throughs don't access that ATC, either there's no ATC that's available um, or uh, they may not be able to meet certain requirements as, as we'll walk through later. Uh, those entities, again, can continue to wheel through our system. It's just that those would have a lower priority across our grid as we, if we get into some of these more challenging grid conditions. The ATC would be calculated across different time horizons and uh, I'll note we've had a number of workshops, I think since last November and, and going into February, where we've learned about other transmission provider practices. And we've tried to leverage as much of those uh, in shaping this particular design, recognizing there are still some differences. But one of the things that we learned from those discussions is uh, the calculation of ATC across different time horizons that entities can access. And, and that was pretty much a common thread across different entities and particularly the time frames across, across which these, are, these uh, ATC values are calculated. But we would calculate ATC across a monthly horizon across 13 months on a rolling basis. And we'll talk about that a bit more later. But then also uh, in daily increments ahead of the day ahead market close where we would calculate that ATC that would be accessible by wheeling through entities uh, to establish that priority. And the idea here is that once you calculate this ATC, uh, you protect the native load within that calculation, you adequately protect the native load uh, to ensure reliable service to them. And then that remaining ATC becomes available for reservation to establish those wheeling through priorities across these different time horizons. And our hope is that to the extent that ATC is accessed across these time horizons, then entities have that certainty, those load serving entities that are looking to wheel through the system, they have the certainty of knowing that for that particular period for which they've established the priority, they have that priority such that if they wheel, if they look to schedule, that that priority will be, uh, uh, will be equal to load. So if we can go to the next slide, and I'll pause after this slide because I think that provides the overview and then we get into the individual components here. But the other elements of the design is that once you calculate that ATC across the different time horizons, um, it needs to be accessed. There needs to be a process for accessing and reserving that ATC. And what we'll be proposing as a starting point is a first come, first serve basis for accessing that ATC. If certain requirements can be met to demonstrate that there's a supply contract effectively and that there's a prepayment of that transmission to the extent that it's, uh, or that ATC to the extent that it's accessed. Uh, but we also introduce uh, an enhancement to, to this approach where, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, to the extent that there's ATC and that not everybody's uh, vying for it, then, you know, first come, first serve basis works. But to the extent that there's limited ATC and there's more entities that are requesting that ATC than it's available, you know, we're suggesting the inclusion of a complementary process where effectively requests can compete for that limited ATC based on the underlying duration of the supply contract such that those entities that, that need, the, need the transmission for, or need that access to that wheeling through priority for a longer duration, um, effectively have access to it over entities that, have, that need it for a shorter duration. In those instances where uh, there's limited ATC to accommodate all of those requests. And we'll talk a bit about that process 
that process as well as shapeable or malleable and, and you know, in talking about what window, you know, what's a reasonable amount of time or of a window to effectively hold these requests and evaluate them together if there's limited APC, because we ultimately do want to provide certainty. And so that window probably shouldn't be too long, but that's what we want to talk through with stakeholders once we get to that particular section. And then uh, we're also introducing a framework where to the extent that entities are unable to access APC on a short-term basis uh, on, on that 13-month horizon in monthly increments or in the daily horizon, or entities want to obtain uh, certainty of that wheeling through priority across a longer-term horizon on a long-term basis uh, for longer than a year uh, in yearly increments, then entities can uh, submit a request and we would be studying these requests in an annual cluster study, leveraging as much the existing processes that we have in place, but ultimately also providing a pathway for these entities that want that certainty to pursue transmission upgrades um, through that process. So studies would identify, can that be accommodated on that long-term basis without an upgrade? But if an upgrade is needed, it provides a pathway for entities to, to fund those upgrades across the ISO system to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to establish that willing through scheduling priority, and then uh, finally, what we're going to discuss as well is a uh, framework for uh, establishing for uh, compensation of this wheeling through priority. To the extent that wheeling through priority is established, what is the appropriate uh, uh, transmission charge for that higher wheeling through priority? For the duration that uh, that has been uh, effectively reserved. So those are those are the elements of the design that we're going to go into a bit deeper into each one individually. But I think we can pause here and just see if there are any kind of initial questions that stakeholders have. We've in the in the straw proposal we've we've looked to lay out in the appendix of the paper as well. Uh, a bit of a comparison based on what we've heard in those stakeholder workshops on how others handle some of these aspects of calculating ATC and native load, uh, as well as some of the other ISOs and RTOs that, that, that have uh, forward transmission processes, how they look at some of these components and different elements. So that's in the straw proposal in the appendix if entities are interested as well uh, to read through. But let me pause here and, and open it up for some questions before we delve deeper into each one of these different components. Okay, and I'll give it a second to let people enter the queue. Um, and while we do that, I do see a question in the chat. It's from uh, DWR. Can you give a brief summary of what other RTOs are doing for ATC? Yeah, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, there's, there's, a, there's an appendix in, in, the, in, in the back that goes into a bit more detail, but I'll just note, um, at a higher level in terms of other ISOs and RTOs, um, New England ISO and the New York ISO don't have a forward ATC or, res or transmission reservation process. Uh, they calculate ATC in the, similar to us in that shorter term horizon um, as we do today. They don't calculate it out because they don't have a transmission reservation process. Uh, but they, in, in the appendix, I think we describe what they do and they treat wheels a bit differently, they afford effectively wheel throughs a lower priority than load um, in, in some of the stress system conditions. But other ISOs and RTOs, uh, I think we, we've canvassed, canvassed uh, PJM and MISO in that uh, appendix. They do have a forward reservation process. I think in concept is fairly similar to what we're putting forward where they have the ability to um, Entities have the ability to reserve transmission service in advance, firm and non-firm, and they calculate ATC across these same horizons in the daily horizon and in the monthly horizon. On a long-term basis, they don't calculate ATC on a long-term basis, but they effectively, if an entity wants transmission service of a longer-term duration, they automatically go into a study process, similar to, I think, what we're putting forward. But as, as we go through some of the, the, the next uh, slides, I'll illustrate some of the differences as well. One of the differences is that um, PJM and MISO, I believe, uh, calculate that their monthly horizon for calculating ATC is a bit longer than I think what, uh, uh, what we're putting forward at 13 months, but also what other entities in the West do. I think other entities are primarily focused on calculating monthly ATC in a 13-month horizon, but 
BGM and MISO, I believe they do it in a 18 month and 20 month horizon, uh, respectively. And then anything beyond that, that's a long term request that is studied. But those are some of the differences, and, and they, and I'll highlight some of the other nuances as we go through uh, the next few slides, illustrating you know the calculation of ATC and how potentially it could be done, particularly the native load component of that calculation. Thanks. We do time. have one question in queue. Are we ready for that question? Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, Michelle, your line's unmuted. You may go ahead. Hey, Milos, this is Michelle Keto from the CPUC. Hey, um, you know, I've been trying to duplicate a lot of the, the work that you guys did here on the these um, calculations. And I'm wondering if you could provide all parties the underlying data so that we can replicate these and understand these in, in greater detail. And then also, after you provide that, could you give us two weeks to look at this before we submit our comments? I mean, this is really incredibly important. And, what we have here are numbers, and I, I can't say that I totally understand them. Yeah, no, that's a fair request, uh, Michelle, and I think we can certainly do that. We may need to mask some information, particularly, you know, but but I think I think we can certainly provide raw numbers, and 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 we'll effort to do that. One of the things as we get into this next set of discussions, as well as we're open to stakeholders, um, you know, suggesting are there variations to the approaches that we've looked at for calculating native load needs. I think obviously there are certainly variations, but what are some of those variations that uh, we can also take some time and potentially in the next week or so publish some additional data that we can share with customers on those different variations. And, and like you said, Michelle, I think if we do that, we certainly extend, we can certainly extend the comment period as well uh, to allow entity to, to dissect that data and, and digest it. So keep that in mind, uh, fair point, Michelle, uh, as we go to the next few slides, if stakeholders have some, some variations on, on um, how potentially to calculate these native load needs based on some historical data that we can pull up, um, we can certainly do that and, and look to publish it here in the near future and, and allow for some additional time for review. Hey, Milos, okay. but even on the, um, the calculation that you uh, guys did regarding the RA capacity, there are some embedded assumptions about, for example, how much power X, how much RA capacity PowerX makes available. So if there's any way for you to literally walk through each component, so you start with TTA, the available transmission capability, you take off the RA capacity, um, yeah. and then if you could specifically show the TRM that you're using um, so that we can literally get to your number so that we can understand yeah. it, that would be really helpful. Certainly, certainly. Yeah. And, and I think we'll do some of that now as we go through some of these examples, but then we can put it on, we can put it on paper as well. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. We had one more question come through the chat from APS. Um, would a supply contract that is contingent upon receiving a reservation of transmission be accept acceptable? Yeah, I think you'll see that uh, when we get to that section. I think that's one of the that's one of the uh, uh, requirements. It, you either have a contract or you have a contingent contract on on the availability on transmission. Yeah, so that's that's one of the that's one of the require that's one of the options there or, or elements uh, for being able to access that ATC. So we'll we'll cover that here shortly as well. Good question, Justin. Thanks, Milos. Do we have any other questions in the queue? There are no additional questions in queue. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you. So in this next section, then, we're going to to start and focus on calculating ATC. And I'll go over a few introductory slides. I'll talk about the first method that we use for potentially deriving native load needs, but I'll talk about all the different components. And then Guillermo is going to walk through um, a different set of, of, of uh, assumptions that could potentially inform or another bookend. And we'll talk about some potential variations to that as well as we go through. But certainly as, as we go through this, pause and ask questions. Um, and if you have, like I said, if you're curious about uh, some different variations to these approaches, we can certainly look at it. And I'll point out some variations that I think we could consider as well that we've heard from other entities since the paper has been published. So let's start with the next slide, please. Okay. So calculating ATC, uh, uh, 
to that's acceptable for, for wheel throughs to establish priority. Like I said, we would calculate ATC in monthly increments across a rolling 13-month horizon, and we'll describe that in subsequent slides. Uh, that's accessible then, you know, in monthly increments, so an entity could potentially, you know, if we publish today ATC for the next, you know, 12 months or so, an entity could come in today and request to reserve ATC for two, three, four months within that horizon. I think this is fairly akin to what's done in the OAT today. We're OAT today. Um, and then as well, calculating ATC in the daily horizon ahead of the day ahead market close. Again, the intent here is if we can do that, then some of these load serving entities that are depending upon wheel through through the ISO system, they can get try to obtain that certainty ahead of the day ahead market close to know going into the day ahead market where they stand, do they have that that higher level of certainty through uh, uh, wheeling through priority. So we'll talk through that as well. And then uh, we're going to focus as well on you know, a, a key and important component of the ATC calculation is the native load component, the existing transmission commitments of which native load is one of those components, how can that be derived? Again, recognizing that this is new to the ISO to uh, now have to identify in this organized market structure, um, having to define how much should we set aside for native load at the enterprise. And, and that has the effect of effectively reducing ATC that's made available uh, for wheel throughs, as you'll see in the equation. And I think this is, again, consistent with what other entities do that is calculating ATC um, they're setting aside transmission capacity for native load or network load, and that has the effect along with other components of re ultimately reducing the ATC that's made available for other uses. Um, and then we'll talk about as well uh, transmission capacity and, and uh, that may need to be set aside for different margins. And the different margins that may be needed may depend upon the level of conservancy of how much transmission capacity is set aside for native load and based on what assumptions. So you'll see us talk through that as well. Uh, in this section, um, and then we'll move on to how that ATC is accessed. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so just to ground us a little bit in 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 what you're going to see next and some of the data, I want to talk through just briefly the ATC calculation, how available transfer capability is derived. And this derivation occurs at, you know, effectively at every inner tie. This is not a one calculation that, that you know, spits out a result, you know, for, for every inner type. You have to calculate this individually at each inner type because the inputs are different uh, for each inner type. But the available transfer capability, the resulting ATC, is a product of looking at the total transfer capability, that's the TCC of a particular inner type. You know, that's that rating. What's the rating of that uh, inner type? Uh, and then you subtract the existing transmission commitments. And these existing transmission commitments in the context of the ISO would be legacy contracts, legacy agreements um, that are more traditionally known as ETCs and TORs on the ISO system. I know there's a bit of you know similar acronyms here, but but they really serve different purposes, and I want to avoid this confusion. But ETC in the context of the ATC calculation is existing transmission commitments. That's a more encompassing uh, bucket of commitment that goes into it, one of which is legacy agreements that we call at the ISO existing transmission contracts that has the same acronym. But the other component of this ETC bucket of existing transmission commitments is the native load needs. FERC has been fairly clear in, in its, in its, in its uh, guidance that transmission providers can set aside transmission, reasonable amount of transmission to meet uh, native load needs or network load. And that component that feeds into that existing transmission commitments uh, element of the ATC calculation. And then further then from the TCC is subtract those ETCs or existing transmission commitments. You also subtract uh, different margins and there's the transmission reliability margin, the TRM, which accounts for different aspects of uncertainty. And we'll cover that in a slide. Uh, uncertainties related to load, uncertainties related to outages. Um, because you're calculating this ATC potentially across longer term horizons, you may not have necessarily all the visibility into your outages. There's some uncertainty related to load, what the load forecast is that far out. So that margin really accounts for that uncertainty and that uncertainty that uncertainty may be bigger or smaller depending on the horizon that you're looking at. But that's the purpose of it is it accounts for, it allows you to, to account for some uncertainty that may materialize as you get closer in time. And then the capacity benefit margin or CBM, 
is uh, another component of the ATC methodology uh, that really accounts for setting aside of transmission at inner size to allow for the bringing in of emergency import supply or effectively imports during emergency conditions. And as we'll talk about later, the trigger here is that it has to be an EEA2, emergency alert level two or higher uh, for this CBM to be accessible. And I'll note that um, based on our review of, of different transmission provider practices and as well as what we've heard during the workshops that we had in November through February, um, the practices here vary between transmission provider. Some transmission provider may not have a need for a TRM or a CBM or uh, others may have both or just one. And again, it all looks into that holistic picture of um, how are you protecting for existing transmission contracts, existing transmission commitments and native load, and are you accounting for some of the uncertainty on the grid that may materialize, particularly in the context of load of uh, different uh, load forecasts or outages on the grid as well that may materialize? And then is there a need for these or have you been conservative enough in any other of the other components uh, that there's not a need for these margins. The idea here is ultimately that there's no double counting of transmission capacity among these components, that if you protect for certain aspects of this as an existing transmission commitment, then you're not necessarily protecting for that as well within the TRM um, and the CBM. So that's the ATC calculation as an overview. Uh, maybe Isabella, can we go to the next slide just to remind me what's next? Okay. Let's go back one slide. Let's pause here just to see if we've grounded ourselves and see if there are any questions. One more thing that I want to add is within this calculation, some transmission providers, not many, but some do, is may potentially add certain counterflows within this methodology, uh, depending on, on what the conditions on the grid are. And that, you know, so it's CTC minus CTC minus TRM minus CBM plus counterflows. Now, what we've seen generally is that those counterflows come in place primarily when, uh, when calculating non-firm ATC from other transmission providers in the firm context. Uh, some may include account for some limited amount of counterflow, uh, but others don't account for counterflow. So I think that's something to consider as well as we go throughout some of these illustrations and these discussions uh, to consider. All right, we do have a question in queue. Michelle, your line's unmuted. You may go ahead. Hey, Milos, this is Michelle. So when you guys were doing your historical calculations, did you include counterflow or not? In, uh, and we'll get to that here in the next one. Not in, not in option one for calculating native load needs based on, AT, based on uh, historical RA. We did not there. In the second, uh, uh, evaluation that Guillermo is going to walk through. I think there we did account for counterflows. And so Guillermo yeah. is going to walk through it, and that's what I think leads to some of these numbers being a bit larger uh, than I think we would otherwise expect. But uh, we'll, we'll walk through that, and I think, you know, there's the question of is it appropriate for us to consider counterflows based upon the, the magnitude of room or ATC that it creates in the system? or do we not account for counterflows and, and that mainly supports lower priority uh, wheel throughs through the system. So uh, that, that's something that we're seeking feedback as we go through this and are there different variations of, of how some of these elements could be considered and, and we'll look to point that out as we go through the, through the data. Okay, great. I have a bunch of questions about that, but thanks for that clarification. Yeah. yeah thanks, Michelle. All right, there are no additional questions in queue. Okay. All right. Well, how are we doing on time? I think we're okay. Okay. Let's go to, yeah. So let's start first with calculating monthly ATC because ultimately we'll get to daily as well, but daily, you know, there's going to be a number of components that are carried through from the monthly into the daily. So calculating uh, monthly um, ATC uh, in, in the monthly horizon uh, and, and particularly the native load component here that we're going to focus on. As I mentioned before, the native load needs, that's a component of the existing transmission commitments, and the transmission provider can set aside an amount of transmission uh, to meet that. Uh, we uh, do not identify, uh, or currently, as I mentioned earlier, we don't set aside transmission today for native load needs 
since we're really calculating this ATC and, and, and what feeds the market in, in these shorter term horizons uh, in the day ahead in the real time. So this is a new component for us. Uh, and that's why I think it's important that, that we have these discussions on, on what's the most appropriate way of calculating a, these native load needs and setting aside that transmission capacity. And so what, what we're going to be walking through is a, a couple of different bookends of how potentially those native load needs can be derived and the resulting ATC if those native load needs are derived in the particular way that we're describing. Um, I, I do want to preface that, like I said, please ask questions, but also please provide suggestions. Is there a different way for how then we can most closely approximate uh, the transmission capacity that's needed to reliably serve native load needs uh, across these inner ties? And so certainly uh, appreciate your feedback today or in writing. And like I said, we'd certainly be open that if there's a variation here that's fairly straightforward for us to do, that we can uh, run it here in the next week or so and potentially publish some of uh, that uh, data to inform your stakeholder comments as well. So let's go to the next slide. Yes. Okay, so, so the three approaches that we're gonna walk through uh, now is for, for calculating native load needs. The first one is looking at native load needs as a factor of the historical resource adequacy, monthly resource adequacy showings that have been made across different inner type points. And the idea here is that, um, you know, one way to approximate those native load needs is to look at the RA program that's currently in place and say that since load serving entities are under an RA program and are securing supply to meet a predefined uh, requirement that's based on a one and two load forecast plus a planning reserve margin, that one way of deriving those native load needs in the future as you're calculating that ATC across a 13 month horizon is to use historical information and historical data uh, to as best approximate uh, what those native load needs are going to be across the enterprise, how much transmission capacity is going to be needed to meet those needs. And so we're gonna show through, through approach one how we calculated some of this looking at 2020 and 2021 data. But the idea here is that we would look across a historical look back period. So, you know, today what you'll see the data is we're breaking it up by year, if you use 2020 numbers, if you use 2021 numbers, or if you use 2020 numbers, what are the what are the different variations that you may get? And so the question is, how far historically should we go back on this approach to look? And should we look at the higher of these the years uh, or some kind of an average of them across that particular time horizon? But that's what approach one looks at. It's, it's historical resource adequacy showings across the inner size. Approach two, looks to um, or attempts to at least look at, you know, putting aside the RA showings, uh, how much did we depend upon imports, uh, all imports to, to serve our load under more stressed or under conditions that are more representative of stress system conditions. And so what approach two looks at is what are those um, import schedules across the enterprise that can be attributable to serving native load uh, and, and particularly focusing on net load peak hours because those could be a representation of the more stress condition as opposed to a regular hour where it just may be the market may be more economically just identifying imports and they may not be really needed to serve native load. It's just they were, they were awarded because they were more economical than internal generation. But really focusing what's going on in those more stress conditions where the market really needs some additional supply. And then uh, approach three, looks at some variation of the two approaches. And again, if, if we change the approaches that are being considered, approach three really puts forward the concept that we can look at, we can look at multiple approaches and take the worst case scenario between those, um, those different approaches that may be uh, being considered. So approach three is not really something unique in and of itself that has data associated with it, but it's a concept that we can look at multiple different scenarios and then derive based on those multiple different scenarios, protect for you know, the average of them or the, or the worst case scenario between those. It, it, I would equate it to akin to running different sensitivities and what we've heard from other transmission providers, what they do uh, when they were presenting in the workshop, they'll run different sensitivities where certain generation is on, certain generation is off, certain assumptions are made. And then you look at potentially the, uh, the average or the worst case scenario between those. But 
these are the two approaches that we'll talk through today. And uh, like I said, there may be variations to these. If these are fairly straightforward for us to run, you know, we can certainly uh, look to do that here in the next week or so and publish updated data. Guillermo and I already spoke about, you know, just being ready to potentially do that since we have now some of this data. It's taken us a bit to compile it, but now that we have some of this data, I think we can look at different permutations, such as looking at maybe the, you know, looking at the single highest load period in the, you know, over a particular time horizon and, and looking at what the import patterns were during those periods and seeing what the resulting APC is. Or removing counterflows from the calculation um, and, and what would that yield. And so we're certainly open to different iterations uh, and, and seek your feedback as we go through it. Uh, before we jump into approach one, I see Michelle has a question. Uh, so I'll, we'll go to Michelle and then we'll jump into more details on, on the numbers for approach one. Hey, Milos, this is Michelle from the CPUC. So I just wanted to focus high level right now. It says approach to consider import dependence during more stressed conditions beyond RA supply. And um, I, I would just note that I went and looked at the loads for July of 2021 um, August of 2021 and September of 2021. And the loads in July and August were roughly 42,000, which doesn't even hit our one in five, which is 44 or 45. So it, it doesn't seem to me that approach two is actually looking at stress system conditions. And I'm wondering if you guys could run something with a stress system condition. So at least looking at a day or a time period when we were running at you know, 44, 47,000 megawatts. So that would be my ask. And then I would also note yeah. that, um, you know, that, I mean, also, if you wanted to look at a situation when we were in an EEA2, I would guess not July 9th because of the, the, the transmission line was in fact down, but um, that would get you the load under a EEA2 situation. But I, I don't think what you, what we have necessarily meant you know, looks at stress. I mean, since you say here the approach to is trying to look at the um, available transmission capability during stress system conditions, it doesn't seem like we, we've reached that point in the historical flows. So, yeah, no, thank you, Michelle. That's a good. Let me just let me just make sure I captured. So you you would say, you know, one variable would be to look at um, look at a, at a at a day where the and 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 a particular hour where the load peaks at. Effectively, what you're suggesting is maybe about 44,000. Is that, is that yeah, approximately what you would have? So the one in two RA peak forecast for CAISO is 45,600, and then it's going up each year. So I think it's maybe 46,500 next year. So it seems to me that we would have to, you know, to look at a one in two stress day, we have to be at least looking at a day where we're at 45,500 and in the future at 46,500. Okay. Yeah, I think I think we can do that, and and we can look at then for that peak hour. Net, um, I guess or, I would choose you, the net. I mean, you want stress system conditions, so I'm trying to identify yeah. the day based on the load forecast, which is consistent with our you know load forecasting RA process. Mm -hmm. And then, as you know, the stressed hours are always hour ending 20. So I would look at hour ending 20 because we have plenty of solar during the day. So you know we don't we're not dependent on the import. So if you look at the import pattern, the import pattern doesn't really have the imports, you know, ramping up until 6 p.m. So that's really when we need them, right? Not at 4 p.m. So really you have to look at probably the hour that solar goes down if you really want to look at our stress system conditions. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that was, that was partly the intent here of option two, looking at those net peak load hours. But I get your point. We'll look at that particular, we'll, we'll see if we can find a particular day where, where the load is uh, at these levels and then, um, See what, what's going on on the grid, and we'll look at effectively simultaneously what's going on 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 the different inner ties in terms of import volumes. Okay, thank okay. you. Good suggestion, thank you. Okay, uh, anything else? That yeah, it looks like we have another thought? question. Yeah, we have another question in queue. Alan, your line's unmuted. You can go ahead. Hi, Alan Mac, cg and &E. Um, I, I just have kind of a basic pr process question. Why are we not just using the methodology that we've settled on in the MIC rather than arguing about 
you know, what's the best way of recalculating, basically, redoing the MIC calculation. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Alan. I, I'm not sure that, in my mind, I'm not sure that the, the, the MIC calculation necessarily gets to this. Um, and this is not recalculating MIC effectively, but, you know, what we've seen historically is, um, is that, you know, at least in the context of approach one, for example, while a sizable amount of the MIC may be allocated, not all of that MIC is necessarily utilized even during the peak month. So there's always space there. I, I think it would be a difficult time to argue to FERC that, that we can just set aside the full amount of MIC without looking at conditions and, and limit access to, to uh, establish that priority without really looking at you know, what, what, what has been the historical need of that. Because while well, the MIC may be allocated up to 29 or something 100 megawatts at certain intertype points, um, you know, may not all necessarily be utilized. Uh, and I think it'll be a difficult challenge to, to protect that amount of make up the inner ties all the way down um, just because it's been allocated but may not have been may not be used so that, that's that's the that's the thought uh, Alan well aren't there California entities trying to utilize uh, imports and getting denied in the mix process I don't think that's the. I don't think that Alan. That's necessarily how that works. The, the MIC is allocated to different load serving entities. Uh, to the extent that somebody doesn't use them, they have the ability to potentially acquire it for somebody else. Uh, but we just haven't seen across every single intertie the total MIC that's been allocated being utilized. And I think what we put forward in in the last MIC enhancements initiative as well is that. Um, we're finding ways of providing a bit more transparency to ensure that entities know who has make where so that if they really want to utilize it, they have access to it. But um, you know, there's, there's, we haven't seen all the make being utilized. So if somebody needs make at a particular inner tie, you know, there's ways of acquiring it from the entity that holds it. We just haven't seen use of it. Okay, so if we're trying to squeeze every last little bit of of MIC that may be allocated and not necessarily used, um, can we make that available to the California entities who might want to use that then before we release it? You're using now MIC interchangeably with ATC. Is that you're you're suggesting that whatever the ATC that's calculated somehow have effectively the first allocated to California load serving entities. Is that what you're suggesting? Just want to make uh -huh. sure I'm following. Yeah. Say that again. Yeah, yeah. Um, for my part, I think that would be that would be a challenge um, unless entities can can demonstrate that they have a. You know, I think in that case, you have a contract for that supply to be able to use it. I think we'll get into some of that when we get into the accessing ATC. But you know, I think we can leave that as an open question. If there's ATC that remains uh, that's calculated across these 13 months um, can that ATC or should that ATC also be accessible by internal load serving entities and I think that's a fair question I just don't know that it that I that a first allocation to load serving entities and then you open that up further to anybody else would work but whether you can access on an equal basis with others um, I, I, I think I think that that can certainly be considered and, and is that valuable? Would parties use it, et cetera? But I think you raise an interesting question, but I just don't know that, that the, you know, protecting for native load plus the resulting ATC that you have, you, you give a first uh, right to access to native load. I think that would be a bit more challenging. But the ability to compete for that ATC, if you can meet similar requirements to what I think we'll note, uh, I think there's certainly an open question for that that can be considered. So good talk, Alan. Good suggestion to think about. We do have a question in the chat from Tyrone Hillman at the PG&E. Um, is there a way that the CAISO can differentiate the ATC for wheeling reservations versus the ATC presently calculated and posted in OASIS on a rolling basis? Uh, let me let me just read that. Can you repeat that chat question one more time? 
Sure. Is there a way that the CAISO could differentiate the ATC for wheeling reservations versus the ATC presently calculated and posted in OASIS on a rolling basis? Yeah, I think so. I, I, if I understood the question from, from Tyrone is whether, yeah, we would calculate the ATC on a rolling basis, we would publish it on OASIS, and we would also be tracking as to how much AT, every time somebody accesses that ATC, how much is effectively remaining um, how much is effectively remaining after those have been accessed. And, and that would be calculated on a rolling basis and that would be transparent and, and available uh, for stakeholders to see. So that informs ultimately as well, is, is an entity going to request some ATC because they they see that there's some available or not. So yeah, we, we will make sure that that's transparent, that the ultimate ATC that emerges is, is transparent and posted and updated. Gosh. I'm not seeing any other chat questions. Do we have any other questions in the queue, Michelle? There are no additional questions in queue. Okay. Okay. Well, let's then uh, go to the next slide. Is this the next slide? Yeah, yeah. So this is, so starting off with approach one uh, for calculating aided load needs. And this is, again, the approach where we're looking at historical resource adequacy numbers to approximate uh, what may be reasonably needed to set aside for native load. Because again, keep in mind as we go through these, the intent is to approximate as reasonably as possible what's the amount of transmission that's needed to ensure that uh, load can be reliably served. And so uh, under this approach, the, the what we looked at in deriving the ATC numbers that you're gonna see on the next few slides is we looked at the total transfer capability of the particular inner tie and we looked at Malin, knob and PV West, that's on the last bullet there, the, the three inner type points that you'll see data on. We took the total transfer capability and then you subtract the existing transmission commitments. And remember the existing commitments consist of legacy contracts. So those are your ETCs and TORs. And so there's some of those on the LIN and I'll talk a bit about that when we get into it. Uh, there's, I think not on knob, but there's some on, on PV West. So you subtract those, um, legacy of, uh, arrangements that have to be honored, commitments. And then you, we, we subtracted the amount of the resource adequacy showing at that particular inner tie uh, for that particular month. And, and we did this calculation for you know, 2020, 2021, and then for a couple of months in 2022 that you'll see. And then we also assumed a 5% uh, transmission reliability margin, a 5% margin that's based off of the uh, total transfer capability of the path. Um, and so I'll, as we go through it, I'll illustrate it. But that's, that's ultimately the resulting ATC that you'll see on these, on these next, next few slides. Total transfer capability minus existing commitments that includes legacy contracts, uh, RA imports, and a 5% uh, TRM uh, margin. So let's go to the next slide just to walk through these numbers and then we can we can pause for some questions. Okay, so on this one, we're looking at knob, um, and this one was a straight TTC minus RA imports because there are no um, ETCs or TR, and there's no uh, legacy contracts in this one that have to be on or across knob. And then also subtracting a 5% uh, TRM. And so what you see there is effectively the resulting ATC. The blue bars are the resulting ATC, if you were using the 2020 resource adequacy showings at NOB, and that's the resulting ATC, and the red bars are uh, the resulting ATC if you were using the 2021 uh, resource adequacy showings at NOB. Those volumes that show up in monthly RA plans uh, that identify NOB as the import point. And so what you see here in this pattern of ATC is, I think as you can probably expect, as you get closer to the summer months, you know, there's plenty of ATC in non-summer months effectively. You know, the, the RA import showings are lower in those months on, on, on these inner ties. Um, but as you get into the summer months, that's where really the uh, RA import showings increase at NOB. And what you see here in the numbers is that in, based on, if we use 2020 resource adequacy numbers, then the um, ATC is lower, um, especially in August and September, I think you know, roughly about 100 megawatts or so in uh, August 
and then drops down to near zero in uh, September. But if we were to use the 2021 resource adequacy import showings at NAV during those months, uh, there were less RA import showings in 2021 than in 2020, and that, that's what led to this increase then in ATC, um, uh, uh, both in August and September, but, but a similar pattern effectively um, between non-summer months and, and, and summer months, whether you're looking at 2020 or 2021. So, see, Michelle, you have a question. Go ahead, and then we'll, we'll go into the next graphic. Hey, this is Michelle from the CQC. Um, hey, I have a, a couple of questions slash comments. So the first one is, um, you know, part of what you're seeing here is that the CPUC changed the rules for RA imports and that there must flow <clears throat> and they must be sourced outside of CAISO. And I'm just wondering, um, can you tell me whether import contracts that are being signed for wheels are must flow? Are they indeed flowing every day, six by 16? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question, Michelle. I, I you know, when, when today, I'm not sure whether those are must flow. I would presume they're not based on some of the data that we've seen, but it, you know, gives the flexibility to the entities depending on need to call on that supply. Uh, but maybe we can ask others if, if, if they want to share what the structure of those is, but I don't believe that they're must flow today. Okay. I mean, if we allowed um, option contracts as well, I'm sure we would use more of it. Um, I have a second question. So I know for reliability purposes, um, you know, California entities may be out there buying import contracts that don't qualify for RA. They might be doing that right now at both ties. How would you incorporate that into this kind of calculation? The fact that we might, you know, for reliability purposes, indeed be buying what would be similar to other entities buying resource adequacy, but we don't call it re resource adequacy. Yeah, and, and across what time frame are these being bought, Michelle? Are you referring to something that's bought in a monthly time frame or closer in time? In both time frames. So people might buy energy, right, to come into California to meet their load, but they might not use it for resource adequacy because somebody might not want to sign a contract that is not sourced from California, right? That's a pretty, you know, so you could go buy at the ties and it could still be sourced, but it's it's being met to, it's being bought to, meet needs and it could be both in the before T minus 45 time frame and it could certainly be after the T minus 30 time frame where you might see a heat wave and you might want to buy energy but I suspect that that's what other entities are going to be using the wheeling contracts for as well so for parity purposes how are you going to count California's purchases that are are made that are similar to external entities RA purchases that are made after T minus 30. Yeah, and and you know, how would you equate that? Is that above and beyond the RA requirements that have been set? Because I think this this particular approach focuses on the RA requirements or the representation of the a reasonable representation of the uh, load serving needs of, of the California LSEs. And so one approach could be that if you know if this is additional purchases above and beyond that, you know maybe there's a potential uh, to buy for that remaining ATC along with other requests, but I think we're certainly open, uh, you know, there could be, I think we want to get feedback from other stakeholders as well about that framework. My concern is, is that, you know, I think the question is, is that reasonable? Is that, um, can that be tied to, is that in excess, above and in excess of what, uh, yeah, it's what the load projections have been? Yeah, I guess yeah. I'm saying, like, you know, let's say uh, we have a vertically integrated utility and they uh, set up their system to buy forward for one and two. They see a heat wave coming. They buy a lot of um, a, a, lot, a lot of imports. And then they say, look, we, uh, you know, our, we don't, that's not available because when we see a heat wave coming, we need to use it. And I'm not seeing any, you know, any possibility that we could include this in here unless you put it in the CBM, so like a pretty large CBM, um, you know, historically, you know, so anyway, I, yeah. I think, no, I think that's a good. big missing component. Those two things are a big missing component in this calculation. Yeah, well, the, the interesting, the question, the, the, let me just, just respond to that because, you know, part of the TRM uh, purpose, and we'll get to that slide, is to account for um, 
you know, for, for a level of uncertainty. So to the extent in our mind, I think to the extent that there is a large heat wave that we're seeing coming down the road, I think that's probably a bit closer, closer in time. It's not necessarily across this 13 month horizon, but I think once we get to the daily horizon and we talk about daily ATC, those inputs can change. And so if, if certain variables are changing, there, there would be the ability, I think, for us to potentially set aside some, some additional transmission capacity if it's available for that, yeah. if it hasn't been already sold. So we okay, can get well, to that here shortly. Yeah, so, so yeah. but my point is, is that you're defining what California needs based on the resource adequacy program, but we buy more imports than that, either non-shown RA, non-shown imports in many timeframes, that's what I'm getting at, which won't be counted in here. And so indeed, California yeah. depends on those imports for reliability purposes and it's not captured here is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, and, and where it potentially may be captured is, you know, if we go down the path of, you know, doing that analysis, as you noted, if we look if if native load needs are then if native load needs are calculated based upon, um, you know, a peak load a, a load period, you know, that, that that's more in the stress condition side, then there may be the potential under that different approach since you're basing it upon a uh, particular peak load period. Uh, there may be the ability to set aside some, some transmission capacity above that as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So if we go Brian, to the no new... additional colon. Okay, yeah. Okay, before if you move on, the... Milos, uh, we did have just one chat question um, asking what the basis is for the 5% TRM. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the 5% TRM is, is we, you know, it's an approximation. Uh, we haven't run a, a study necessarily to derive it. We've looked at what others do in, in the in the industry. Some have a flat percentage, you know, two, three, four, five percent. Um, others are more um, granular in deriving different studies to support it. But usually, that TRM, you know, does not exceed, you know, close. Yeah. Maybe I think we've seen a handful of cases where it maybe goes in certain points up to ten percent. But it's usually in that. Uh, you know, three to six to seven percent range. We just chose five per range, five percent here as an approximation for for TRM. Uh, we recognize that we're going to need to do a, a, a you know a, a, an assessment and settle on, on what that TRM value is. But we thought that this was a reasonable uh, number or reasonable approximation based on what others are doing in the industry. Uh, and so we used it here to, to be a bit more illustrative in in what what does this mean. Uh, in terms of this particular approach, what's the effect of a 5% TRM on these inner ties? Uh, the, the TRM ultimately could be a bit less, uh, could be a bit more depending on different months and different conditions. Thanks, Milos. Okay, so on this one, so we talked about knob on the previous slide. Now we're talking about what's going on on Malin. Um, and this one is, again, remember TTC, I think this one's TTC is 3,200. You subtract uh, the existing commitments, uh, that's the legacy contracts, and then you subtract resource adequacy imports that were shown during these months, and then you add that 5% TRM, where in this case, 5% of 3,200 is 160 megawatts. And you get these numbers then on Malin based on uh, these largely based influence by the volume of RA import showing. And so what you get is a similar pattern as a knob where outside of these summer months, you know, there's a fair amount of ATC. But once you, as you start getting closer to summer, uh, the RA import showing that Malin increase. And so what you see there is that if you're looking at ATC derived based upon 2020 RA import showings, uh, similar pattern to knob where you get to August, there's a small amount, I'd say that's probably around 100 megawatts, but then there's nothing in September. But if you're looking at 2021 RA import showing volumes, then the ATC uh, is, is, is a bit higher. I think in September there, you have approximately 250 so, uh, megawatts or so of ATC that could be accessible. So that's that's uh, Malin. And let me just mention as well that, and this is another variable here that could occur across different inner ties. The ECC and the TOR component, the existing transmission contract component of this calculation, uh, you know, the, the existing transmission contracts are fairly set. Uh, you know, there's, there's, I think, 1,200 megawatts on Malin. Uh, 
uh, I believe, is, is between different entities of, of existing transmission contracts. However, uh, certain entities, and it's not necessarily unique to Malin, it occurs in other points as well, but certain entities may make some of these rights available to the market in advance, a year in advance or so, uh, where, where in, a, in return for congestion revenue uh, rent, um, right, right, uh, CRRs, and effectively, that, if they make that available then on that longer term basis, that's not something then that you would protect for as an existing commitment because that's been now made available to the market and that could increase that ATC. I think in this case, while there's about 1,200 megawatts or so of, there's 1,200 megawatts of ETCs, there's also about, I think, uh, uh, I can't remember now the exact amount, but roughly 400 or so megawatts of ETCs that are made available to the market uh, so, so really what we're protecting here is about seven to 800 megawatts of existing transmission contracts. Uh, but, you know, that could change from year to year, you know, to the extent that entities are not making those existing transmission contracts available to the market, we would have to protect for the pool 1200. But to the extent that they do make it available, then, you know, that would increase that, that APC amount. And, and I'll note as well, consequently, you know, as Michelle was mentioning in, in, in one of the earlier slides that um, entities, California load serving entities may also be acquiring some uh, import capability from some of those transmission rights holders or that have existing transmission contracts to support import deliveries into the ISO. You know, to the extent that there's limited ATC across Malin um, through the ISO's portion of the calculation of the ATC, you know, there may be opportunities for entities to acquire some of that import capability from other holders that have those existing transmission contracts. And that's another way of establishing that uh, wheeling through priority by accessing those existing contracts that others may have. So there, there may be some flexibility here, depending if, if the ATC values are lower on the ISO side because of those, those transmission rights haven't been made available to the, to the, to the market, uh, that's another potential avenue. Let's go on to the next slide and just just walk through this one and then and then we can open it up for questions. So this is then just looking at what's going on. Malin and Knob are the, the primary kind of points or for lack of a better term, the more popular, the more used intertie points that we see both by wheel throughs but also by imports. But we just want to do see what's going on on, on other intertie points and particularly T V West here. Uh, Palo Verde and, and a conglomerate of other uh, facilities. And if you do the same calculation by looking at the total transfer capability, you protect for certain existing transmission contracts and their volumes of contracts that have to be protected here. Uh, and you subtract the RA import showing uh, plus add a 5% DRM. These are the resulting ATC values. So, you know, I think this is, this is a, uh, Separates a bit from Malin and Knob because it looks like here there's there's a there's a fair amount of ATC except for the outlier here of September if you use the 2020 RA import showings, but otherwise you know, it's a fair amount of ATC that's available throughout the year. Um, so if we go one more slide and then I think we'll open it up for questions. Uh, and I apologize if this is a bit smaller. If if you go to the slides on the uh, initiative website, you may be able to zoom in or you may be able to zoom in on your WebEx. But we try to do a comparison now just for a couple of months because we got some of the more recent RA showing information under the methodology that we've been talking about where you look at total transfer capability and you subtract uh, existing contracts, you subtract native load needs represented by RA import showings and you subtract a 5% reliability margin. What's the resulting ATC now if you look at uh, July and August of 2022, and what you get is, or what we get is, that the additional green line, um, the additional green line for July and August, where based on RA import showings in July and August of 2022, you see this pattern of less imp RA imports being shown at Malina Knob, which increases the ATC now to, um, to roughly that looks like on, on Malin to approximately 1,200 and, and then now, um, yeah, in August also to around kind of that same amount. But we, you see a steady increase in ATC, particularly across Malin and now based on 
you know, since 2020, uh, based on less RA imports being shown across those inner ties, which increases the ICC. So I think I think that concludes this first bookend. And so let's open it up for questions under this particular approach, and then we can move on to the next approach where Guillermo is going to walk us through a, a, a different set of assumptions. And I think Michelle, yeah. Yeah, hey, this is Michelle. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the TRM for Cobb or for Malin. So um, if you calculate a TRM of 5%, that's 160 megawatts. But I would note that the, um, maybe I could ask you why then if the, let's see, the tr total transfer capability on Malin is 3,200, but the MIC is roughly 2,900. So there's, 300 megawatts that we don't allow, you know, that we don't allocate for internal load to use. And so it seems weird that we would make that full amount available for wheels. So it seems to me that the TRM needs to be the same amount as that. And my example would be, um, you know, 3,200 megawatts of TTA, let's say the MIC is 2,900. Let's say KISO uses, let's say there is no ETC that you're protecting for let's say California load comes in with 2,900 megawatts, according to your calculation, there would still be available wheeling capability, right, at that tie, because you're not fully protecting for that amount that you guys don't make available. And so if it's not available to internal load, I, I'm struggling to see how, can, how it can be available for wheels. Yeah, and, and thanks for that question, Michelle. I, I think part of the, the difference is, and, and we can look at certainly aligning some of these values a bit more between the MIC and, and the ATC. But I think a challenge is going to be in that, you know, the MIC is, is really calculated, I think, on an annual basis, uh, whereas, you know, this ATC is a, is a malleable number uh, across each month that may differ based upon the inputs. Um, you know, I, I don't know that it's, you know, if, if, um, you know, if right. we have some outage information, Right. I get it that you might change the daily amounts and we can, that's a different question, but if you won't allow California to reserve it, I don't understand how you can allow external entities to reserve it. Yeah, what I was trying to get at is, is that the volume of the TRM may be different um, and, and how you're protecting for the outages may be different in January versus uh, a summer month just because right. you know the but risk the, of outage is a bit different and, and right. but the MIC is is an annual number so we base it yeah. we we still don't allow california to buy any more than let's say 2900 in the example so it doesn't yeah. make any sense that we would allow the wheels i mean yes on a daily basis you could say we don't have an outage but on a monthly reservation it seems like we have to t treat you know we have to be um you know equal in our treatment. If California can't use it and we don't think we should use it and we don't think we should allocate it to potentially use, I don't see how we can allocate it to wheels. Yeah, yeah, and all I was trying to point out is that, that currently uh, these are a little bit of different functions that they play, how MIC is derived versus how the ATC is derived. And we're certainly open to coordinating these numbers a bit um, uh, between the MIC and, and, and the ATC and potentially, you know, I think I think you brought this up. Uh, I don't know if it was today or, or before, but potentially increasing the amount of MIC maybe that could be allocated to to load serving entities. Uh, but but I think it's important that at least within the ATC calculation, it's uh, it's not necessarily a static number, but that at least the risk of outage is more you know variable across different months of year. Uh, so. Because of, in the summer months, the risk may be different than in, than in, in a different month, which is I yeah. know, different than how MIC is done today, which is done once a year for the entire year. Um, yeah. Right. But if we're not going to make it available for California to reserve, it's odd that we would make it available for external entities to reserve. Right? Yeah. So it seems yeah, and, like and in your, and, Yeah. And in your scenario, to the extent that MIC were allocated up to the third pool 3,200 megawatts, would that Kind of address that concern? Yes, that would address the concern. Okay. Thanks. We do have a question. Well, alternatively, if, sorry, alternatively, if you use, um, if you just make the TRM the same as the difference between the TTA and the 
operating transmission capability or the MIC, that would go to address my concern as well. And it's about 10%. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, going to the chat question, um, is it fair to assume that the CAISO staff's TRM estimate of 5% would be more likely to be fine-tuned up rather than down as you refine this proposal? Yeah, I, I think I think that may depend upon the month uh, potentially, because ultimately I think with a CRM, what you're trying to do is is really capture that risk of uh, risk of uh, unplanned outage. To the extent that there's a planned outage, you know, you would you would count for it and reduce the TCC uh, as you know the information, uh, but but. Yeah, you know, I, I think in some months may be lower than that, and in other months it, it may be a bit higher. So it could vary. That that margin could vary to be reflective of the of the true risk. You know, if we're seeing no outages in in January, you know, maybe we're less conservative on the TRM. But if you know that in certain months, you know, you've consistently experienced uh, uh, an amount of of unplanned outages or other outages, that you would need to account for that now. The amount we think still, you know, based on for guidance, still has to be reasonable. So, so ultimately, I think you'll you'll see us uh, you know, put some data around these numbers when we're defining what that TRM is, and it could be different, you know, for different inner ties. It's not necessarily a static number that that applies across any inner tie, but it's really based upon the conditions um, and what you're seeing across different points in the system. So hopefully that addressed the question. I guess the answer is it's, it could be variable across different months, uh, but but it still has to be a, a reasonable value. Thanks, Milos. So we do have another question in the queue from Doug Bosignone. Doug, you may go ahead. Your line's unmuted. Hi, this is Doug Bosignone for the Bayer Municipal Transmission Group. Um, I just wanted to comment on this aligning the MIC and, and the, the wheeling priorities. So I think it's a good idea to make sure there's alignment between the two, um, but I think it would only make sense to to increase the MIC to 3,200 if that's what you actually expect it to be available. And I think the reason it's – it's not shown at 3,200. It is. It's almost never available at 3,200. It's almost always derated to some amount. So, it, you know, whatever value is used, it needs to be something that you actually expect to be possible. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that, that's a great point. Like that's what, that's why, you know, at least within the ATC context, the, the, that that's the that's the component as well as. as what do you expect here to be available that's reasonable? And, and you know, if you know of an outage well in advance across that 13-month horizon, then you, you can adjust that TTC, the total transfer capability, to reflect that. Otherwise, you're trying to project or estimate some risk of outage uh, within that TRN component, which acts as a way of reducing uh, the, uh, the ATC ultimately. Yeah. And then as so you get closer in time, whether those conditions are materializing, there's the opportunity to release that if they don't, you know, those conditions are not materializing as you expect and that creates more ATC. Yeah, and I think if there is, it sounds like accounting for this in the TRM could make sense, but if it is going to get released closer to the month, then there really should be an adjustment to, to how MIC yeah. is made available uh, to, to yeah. match up with that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So thank you for that. Doug. Thank you. All right, there are no additional questions in queue. Okay, so, so let me just introduce this topic and then I'll turn it over to, to Guillermo here. But um, as I was noting it earlier, you know, some of this data, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions about this particular data set because of the volume of the numbers that, that, that we've shown. You know, it's in some instances fairly sizably different than the numbers we just showed under approach one, although, you know, based on 2022 numbers, the ATC seems to be creeping up fairly highly under under the previous approach uh, as well. So, uh, you know, Guillermo is going to walk us through what we try to do here. Really, is 
is look at what's actually going on on the grid. You know, how much ATC is available based on what are the actual conditions that are showing up on the grid in terms of imports that are flowing. And we accounted here for counterflows as well. Um, and Guillermo is gonna walk through this. But as I mentioned earlier, think about one of the variables here is that we can look at, you know, well, what's the, what's the number if we're not counting for counterflows? And I think still it's gonna lead to some ATC based on some of the initial things that we've looked at. So it's gonna lead to a few hundred megawatts of, of ATC. But you know, those are the, that, that's the, if you have any suggestions as, as Guillermo goes through this, because now we have some of this data and we can play with it a bit more if there's any suggestions on an additional scenario that we can run. As I noted earlier, we can commit to make that available here in the coming weeks and help inform some of your comments as we, like I said, our first time trying to calculate here and derive these native load needs and recognizing the importance that it has on, on both for California load serving entities, but also the remaining ATC amount. So with some of that introduction, uh, let me turn it over to Guillermo to walk us through uh, the analysis. Thank you, Milos. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me add more to the premise of this approach as Milos introduced in this section, this second approach. There are obviously many permutations of what the bookend could be, and basically every component in the calculation can be subject to the debate on what the best treatment should be. The idea of this second approach is to start the discussion with a very simple reference, and that is what actually happened previously based on historical performance. It's not based on assumptions, it's not based on philosophies, it's simply what the actual historical data is telling us. Yes, we have certain nominal values for the limit of the intertie, the TTC. We have some nominal values for the ETC. We see historical deal rates, margins, but if we look at the past performance, how did the capacity actually look like? I'm not talking about intentionally taking an approach to get the most conservative or the most liberal approach per se. Just set aside that for a moment and let's just look at what actually was utilized and made available in recent historical performance. Obviously, the very own point of how far we should look back or what our historical reference should be is still a subject to the debate. Whether it should be 2021, the previous immediate year, the last three years, the last five years, and maybe the point on time where we exceed 45,000 megawatts, that is still a very own point of debate. The idea of putting this in front of you is to give you that historical perspective and bring to the discussion the various components that can play a role in determining the available capacity using this historical reference. Using this approach, we have derived effectively three variations of that historical-based calculation. Each of these three variations use the same foundation, the same logic in the calculation. The only difference is the sample of hours utilized. How do we determine the sample hours to consider? Well, it's very simple. We just take a reference of the top hours based on the net load peak of a given month. We did that for the four months of the summer 2021, and that is the reference we are using just to highlight the, the calculation and all the components that play a role in this determination. In order to illustrate that calculation, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is a very graphical way to see the capacity available or the total capacity breakdown of a given intertie. Uh, the top value is what we call the, the limit of the intertie, that is the TTC. There may be the rate, outages that may happen on the intertie, and that portion is going to be subtracted. And that is what we call the portion in rate as the derated capacity. Once we subtract that derated capacity, we effectively get what we call the OTC, the operating transfer capability. Now, certain interties are going to have some ETCs, TORs. Uh, there may be a nominal value of that capacity, mainly, let's say, over a thousand megawatts. When we go and operate the market on a daily basis, 
there may be cases in which some of that capacity, ETC STRs, were already released, and therefore they are made available to the market. They are going to be part of the capacity that is subject to optimization and utilization by any scale that comes on that intertie. Still, there may be a portion that is reserved because they could be utilized. There could be a portion that can be actually made up into the market and is going to be used. If that portion that is reserved is not clear in that day in that market, it can be held back onto the last minute opportunity into the real time. That is the reason you have these two pockets. One is the reserve TORs and the scale TOR. The scale TOR is effectively the one that was clear in the market. And because we still have to set aside the capacity that is reserved, that capacity is not really available to the market. So we start with the TTC, we did rate the capacity, we get the OTC, we put aside the reserve TOR CTCs, and that is effectively what we call the market available transfer capability. That is the portion of the transmission capacity that is available to the market to be cleared optimally based on imports, dynamics, exports, and wheels, you name it. A portion of that may still be some scheduled TORs, ETCs, and that is the dark red portion that you have in there. All these three components, the rated capacity, reserve TORs, and scheduled TORs, ETCs, effectively uh, represent the capacity that is not going to be optimized and made available into the market. Now, let me start from the other uh, end of the, of the range. Given the capacity that is made available in the market, the market is going to allocate that limited capacity to the different components. Obviously, there will be uh, two direction uh, scales here. There could be imports or exports. The exports are going to provide counter flows to the imports and may allow higher levels of imports to come through the intertype. So at any time, there may be some of all of these components in any permutation. In some cases, we may have to consider that there could be exports flowing through that intertype. And obviously, a natural question is going to be, how do we account for that? Again, the very first reference is what actually happened. And then we can go into, based on what happened, what makes sense to consider in a looking forward approach. So when we have that intertype capacity made available, the market is going to optimize that to different components. It may clear exports that are going to provide counter flows. A portion of that uh, import capacity may be allocated to the dynamic resources, the static imports. In some cases, it may not be just for energy, but also for AS provision. There may be some dynamic resources that can provide some type of AS and still utilizing that capacity. And obviously, there could be some capacity allocated to wheels, EIM transfers. In some cases, when the intertie exhaust uh, its capacity is going to be at the limit, it's going to be congested, and therefore the full capacity is utilized. In some cases, the intertie may not be fully utilized, and still we may have some, what I call in this portion in green, the unloaded capacity. Even though we allocate and reserve all the capacity that we have, there is still room available in, in, on the intertie, and that is not uh, infrequent to see. Typically, obviously, in the tight supply conditions, that may not be the case. But it may be the case that in some cases, we have some unloaded capacity. And I, I just saw a comment on the comment of what is the static imports. Well, we have, we have two types of schedules that may come into the intertie. Those that are resource specific, that we call the dynamic resources, and those that are system resources. We don't know exactly what is the origin, the resource backing up that, and that is what we call typically the static imports. And when we account for the net schedule on the intertie, and that would be everything that comes in the import direction minus everything that goes into the export direction, is what we typically refer as the net schedule. When we refer to this in the system level context, is what we call the net schedule interchange. The same concept applies to each individual intertype. Imports minus exports gives you the total net schedule. In that case, it would be the dynamics plus the static imports plus the AS provision uh, minus the exports. That is the net schedule flowing on that intertype. 
and that accounts for the bottom four pockets that you can see in there. So what is in the middle? In between these two pockets of the unavailable capacity because it's set aside, is derated or preserved, and the lower end, that is the utilization, that utilization we can classify it as the capacity, the supply to serve the CAISO load. Now, you can see that there is a note on the left-hand side because when we account for all the supply that comes into the entire time, the reality is that a portion of that supply is going to be able to meet the CAISO load, but also the exports, the other exports that are across the different interface in the system. So we can be more granular and, for, and for instance, apply a pro rata logic that, well, if we have 8,000 megawatts of total imports, well, those imports have to serve 45,000 megawatts of load plus 5,000 megawatts of exports. So we pro rata locate that in, in imports coming to, to serve CAISO load. What remains in the middle, that is effectively the capacity that historically was used to, to, uh, to support the wheels or anything that was the utilized to clear the transfers or any unloaded capacity, that is effectively what we call the avail available capacity. We don't account for the unavailable, we account or factor in the portion that is to serve the CAISO load and what is left is effectively the available capacity that could be utilized for the wheels or anything else. And this is effectively the calculation that we have for either of the three variations of the approach. And based on the summer 2021, again, this is just taking a, a point on time as a reference, and we just took the most immediate year, that is 2021. And how do the numbers look like? Okay. Can we go to the next slide, please? Here we have uh, the three variations. And again, the logic, as I described it in the previous slide, is exactly the same for either of the three variations. The only difference is how many hours or, or what hours we are taking for the calculation. For the approach 2A, we are simply taking the peak load, the peak net load of the month whatever that is. And we do the math and we come with these numbers and this is broken out by intertie and by month of the summer month. And you can see that the numbers vary largely depending on the intertie, depending on the month, and obviously it's subject to many different conditions. So uh, having an expectation whether it should be a value higher or lower is, is quite relative. It's just the peak out of the month. And for instance, just to pick a number, right? We have Malin, for instance, for July, is telling us that based on that calculation, the historical capacity that was still available at the net load peak hour was about 941 megawatts, considering all the components that I just described. Now, relying on one single hour is quite a, yeah, unstable, right? It's basically relying on the outlier. Whatever that hour happens to be, we take it, and it's not very stable. So the second approach is using the same logic, but instead of using one single hour, let's just take the top five hours of the month and just take a simple average. So each row that you have here from one to five is taking the top hour and getting the value. If you take, for instance, the top hour three, we are taking the top three hours and getting a simple average of that capacity for that month for that intertie. So if we were to take the top five hours, for instance, for Malin for July, on average, on this five hours, we have about 1,700 watts of capacity that was still historically available on that intertie in July 2021. The approach to C is not different in calculation. The only difference is that we are taking the top 10% hours of the month. 10% of 30 times 24 is like 70 hours. We are talking about the top 70 hours and we just get a, a simple leverage of these hours to get you that available capacity. And the value for that point on reference, Mali in July is still about 1600 megawatts. These are the three variations. Now, let me just put back this into perspective. As I indicated, this is simply telling you historically what actually happened on those interties. Now, 
we have to get from this starting point into what we could potentially utilize for this looking forward approach of estimating what capacity could be made available. And there are many variations, many permutations. Every component could be subject to debate. Uh, historically speaking, what should our reference be? Last year, last three years, last five years, uh, the last two hours where we have loads above 45,000 megawatts, above 47,000 megawatts, that is a point of discussion. The other component that could be sensitive is about the counter flows. In some enterprise during this month, uh, as you may have seen in the summer reports that we provided last year, you can see the trends of all the supply coming into the import direction, all the exports going out to the different enterprise. And in some cases, for instance, in Mali in July precisely, when we have these net load uh, peak hours, it happens that there was a lot of exports flowing out through Mali. And obviously that is going to provide a lot of counter flows. That explains why when we look at Mali for July, for this house, the number is quite big because the counter flows are making more capacity available. That is factually what was happening in July 2021. So the question is not whether that happened or not, but whether it should be a good reference uh, to move forward prospectively to assess if that is an approach to consider, whether the export should be considered for, for providing counter flows or not. And there may be other permutations in the in the approaches. So let me pause here and see if there are any questions about the procedure, and then uh, we can continue with the discussion. We do have one question in queue. Doug, you may go ahead. Your mind's unmuted. Thank you. This is Doug Bochignone from the Bayer Municipal Transmission Group. Can you go back to the previous slide? I'm trying to understand the, how you're treating the EIM transfers, um, and I and and the the asterisk that you had on the left maybe is addressing this, but I'm not sure how it matches up. Is are these transfers EIM transfers to Kaiso or from Kaiso or through or or all of the above? It could be in either direction. It could be a transfer coming into the KISO. It could be a transfer going out of the KISO. And uh, the, the treatment is quite simple. Basically, we simply calculate all the scales coming from imports and exports and the remaining, that is the available capacity in the middle. It, it's available. We assume that it's available regardless how that was distributed between wheels, transfers, or unloaded capacity. If you already know the unavailable capacity, and you already know how much flow because of imports and exports, whatever is left has to fit in the three pockets in, in any distribution. So indeed, for the calculation of this uh, approach, we don't even to have to explicitly calculate the transfers because it's whatever is left uh, available. Yeah, okay. I guess what I'm struggling with is, I mean, the EIM transfers are, are essentially competing with the intertie bids and mm -hmm. you know if if they're more economical than the intertie bids for the the import bids then presumably a big portion of those are going to be serving load you know maybe some end up supporting a wheel through or a transfer through the ISO mm -hmm. but it seems like if you're going to if you're going to acknowledge that the inner tie bids that cleared were needed to serve load, why wouldn't you also acknowledge the EIM transfers that were needed to serve load? So that's one comment. And then the the flip side, and and I think this goes for either EIM transfers out or or counterflows um, that were scheduled out. I, I guess what I I think we just have to seriously consider whether you can count on those it, during the periods when you when native load needs to be served. Can you count on the counterflows being there and freeing up that capacity or not? I think that's going to be a crucial point, and I think probably be good to get some insights about what other other transmission providers do, because I would guess that unless they can really count on it. 
they're not going to make a firm commitment to make the transmission in the other direction available. Yeah, no, these are perfect questions, and I really appreciate how you characterize this because these are exactly the points of discussion, right? Should we account for intertie counterflows or not? And you are raising a very good point about the IAM transfers, right? Uh, one of the approaches that we took is this is effectively what happened, and there is debate on whether the IAM transfer should be part of the supply consideration or not because they are optimized, they are contributing to meeting the load. In some cases, it is in the import direction. And the fact that they are optimized in the real time may, may, may create another level of complexity, whether something that is clear optimally in the last minute in the real time should be considered for this looking forward approach. Uh, but all these are great points, and I really want to, to stress the point that the whole point of illustrating this is precisely to have that type of discussion. What makes sense to consider based on what historically and factually happened in, in, in previous years? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks. And maybe while I'm just talking, I'll bring up one third, another point because I think it's related to that is at the beginning, not today, but in the straw proposal, you talked about not considering the inter internal transmission constraints. And I think this is one where you really need to think hard about that because um, in essence, what you're assuming is that the internal resources will be, you know, optimized to to ensure the transfer could take place. And I'm not sure that that's really a good assumption, because it, it could be the case that, you know, what was really happening is I'm thinking particularly about the the com, you know, you know maybe for some of these hours, yeah, there's no problem getting into Northern California cross path 26 through Southern California and out. But there may be other hours where where that path 26 is fully loaded and it won't matter that Cobb wasn't fully loaded. You know, increment, adding a megawatt in a import could just mean you're backing off generation in Northern California and increasing generation in Southern California to make sure you could facilitate the transfer. Yeah, that's a good point, and I think uh, we we did check, for instance, the the conditions of path 26, and we could see that that constraint barely gets congested, at least in the same historical period, right? And strictly speaking, it wouldn't be an issue just relative to path 26. Effectively, it could be any internal constraint in the Kaiso system, right? We yeah. have several constraints in the northern part of the system that effectuate the same logic, the same dynamic, and once they are activated. So it could become quite a daunting task to try to assess across the hundreds of constraints and whether there could be one case in which we are going to be limited. And we did some assessment, at least through the most critical constraint, that is part 26, and we found that, generally speaking, on that historical reference, there was no such condition that prevented part 26 to, to flow the, the capacity. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and, and this Thank is Milos. I just wanted to jump in. Uh, gr great discussion, and, and Doug, uh, you know, on the uh, counterflow question, you know, I'll, I'll note that we did look, at, and, and I think we'll do a bit more of that uh, looking here in the, in the near future. But on the counterflow question, you know, generally counterflows uh, only support non-firm ATC, but we did see entities where where only a X percent of, of you know, there's some assumption about some volume of historical counterflows. Uh, could potentially you know, increase that ATC or contribute to firm ATC. So we'll do a bit more digging on that, but that's a, that's a great question and, and a good discussion there. Thank you. All right, we're moving to the next caller in queue. Michelle, your line is unmuted. Yeah, this is Michelle again. So I just wanted to note again that um, at the very beginning of this, we were saying that we were trying to look at the system during a stress system time and that July was only 42,000 megawatts. So even if you're looking at the congestion across path 26, if you're not really looking at it on a stress system day, I don't think it's indicative, necessarily indicative of what you might see on a stress system day, right? Well, I think that would be another level of debate, Michelle, why you define as a stress day, right? Because I can tell you, we look at July 21 very closely, and I can tell you, 
the days that happen to hold the peak hours. These were the days where we actually issue flex alerts. These were the days in which we actually have rocking feasibilities. So if your definition of stress days is to reach certain level of load, and that is still subject to debate. So wait, so maybe I could just ask you, when you plan your transmission system, what load are you planning for? I, I will defer that question to somebody else. I'm not in that space to be able to give you an educated answer. But uh, I think my point is about what your definition of a stress base is, because the stress base for us is when you are really running tight supply and July 28, 28 were those type of days. Okay, well, maybe if we could get the data, we could look at it and see it. But if load was only 42,000, um, we wouldn't necessarily need to um, import, right? So that's, I mean, maybe it was stressed for other reasons. Maybe there were outages or things like that. But from a pr an import perspective, it's not, um, well, let me put it another way. When other balancing authorities are doing these ATC calculations, do you know whether they use less than one in two loads or do they use one in 10 or one in 20 loads? I don't know, maybe Miller can help me here. I don't know if he has a reference. Yeah, yeah, but we've heard, you know, throughout the workshops is some, some use one in two non-coincident peaks, some others use one in five, one in 10. So, so it really, it, it, it really varies uh, the type of uh, load that they, they ultimately utilize. Okay, do any of them use anything less than one in two loads? When they're I, I haven't heard of, yeah, I haven't run into anything that, that's less than one in two. Okay, um, so another question is, if you use this methodology, um, I mean, I think this is where the ETC becomes really important because if you're, well, I guess maybe one question is, did you actually take the D rates on the system on these days? We have the two variations, taking the nominal ETC value and another variation taking the OTC value. The one that we are showing, I believe, is based on the nominal TTC, uh, but we have the same calculation done for. But using did you the actually OTC. look at derated capacity on that particular day? Oh yeah, we have that calculation also done. Yes. And is that what you're showing? Uh, I think this one is based on the nominal. That okay. is based on TTC. Yeah. So, so it might have been that on that day, even though Cobb is three thousand, what was only a what was uh, derated was less than that, right? So then? It was about 2,800 or so. Okay, so it was 2,800. But then when we're calculating what's available for wheels, we're essentially giving difference between the 2,800 and 3,200, right? Yeah. Well, you, you, would, you would account for a, you know, so, so these numbers that, that yeah, will share, if you go to the next slide, these yeah. numbers are uh, TTC, total transfer capability minus then everything that, that he went through. These numbers do not account for a uh, transmission reliability margin yet. Uh, but so if you're actually... calculating this across a 13 month horizon, you would, you would take a, some size you know, um, uh, off of the TRM as well. Okay, I, I guess maybe I'm trying to understand, does it, uh, let's, say, let's say Malin is 3,200, but on that day it's 2,800. Um, does it take into consideration that 400 megawatt D rate or does it assume, is the calculation just the TT, um, uh, you know what I'm saying? Because if you, yeah. if you back into it this way, you could say 1,600 megawatts available, but it's not really available because the transmission line is D rated on that particular day. Right, and I, I don't recall me, Lucy, we put the two variations of the metric, but this one is, based on the nominal TTC. We have the same calculation implemented for uh, accounting for the rates that is based on the OTC. And yes, there is variation, there's, there's reduction as expected. Yeah. Okay, and so if you use the OTC, which is the operator transmission capability, the amount of ATC available is go goes down, is that right? Yes, it, it goes down. For July, it would be like 200 megawatts less you know, based on, no, actually it would be like 400 megawatts less. Can you? publish that information and give us the data, that would be really helpful to understand, right? Because here you're basically saying this much is literally on that day, that much isn't available, right? Yeah, but, but I think there is a picture yeah. that, that is where Milos was trying to portray, right? 
uh, if we were looking into a prospective basis, we know that potentially the enterprise have, have to experience some delays outages. And that is where the understanding would be to apply some type of margin, right? Uh, it could be completely based on historical, just based on the OTC, assuming that the same conditions are going to repeat for, for the future, right? And that is, again, another level of debate of whether we should take the PTC and project some margin for potential delays or take the OTC and don't take any margin. So all these are valid permutations that are worth to, to explore. Okay. So let me just walk through why this number concerns me. So there's 3,200 megawatts at Malin, right? There's, once you, uh, you derate for MIC, there's 2,900 megawatts available for California, or uh, available, there's 2,900 megawatts available in MIC. Then you take out um, the 1,200 megawatts of uh, ET ETCs. So there's 1,700 megawatts available for California. So this is basically saying that there's 1,700 megawatts that it's available for wheels, and there's 1,700 megawatts available for California load. It's just not feasible to implement that. But that's where the counterflows come in, right? That, that's the counterflow question, right? Well, it, it goes to two and, things. And, it goes to, yeah, it, it goes yeah, to the and, counterflow. And, uh, I, yeah, and I think for these months, again, it, it's not a, if you're looking just at million, uh, the full 1,200 um, is not the ETC amount. There's some that's been made available already in advance to the market to optimize in the year ahead time frame. So you're not protecting yeah. for the full 1,200. Sorry, I, I just want to talk about that for a second. So um, it looks to me from the public data on Kaisa's website that PowerX makes 400, 426 available, but they don't have to, right? So it just depends on if they want to sell it or not to California. So that's right. Right. Here we used it and we say, hey, it's available, but then we go into next year and PowerX decides not to sell it to anyone, right? So yeah. it's not really yeah. available to us. So yeah, but that, then, that's what I said. Yeah, that's what I said up front. Is, is this number, ETC, could shift a little bit depending on whether parties make it available or not. These numbers here consider that that amount has been made available, so the amount that you're, you, know, you, you have to protect is a bit less, but, but yeah. Right, but we do that calculation before we know if PowerX has made it available, right? Has sold it. Well, it, it, on a prospective 13-month basis, until that gets made available, you wouldn't make that adjustment. So, so remember, this is this is the data that he's showing. Guillermo is showing is historically last year's data that could inform next year's, you know, how you derive next year's ATC numbers to the extent that. You, everybody's holding their ETCs and nobody's made it available to the market. You're just protecting for the full 1,200. At the point that somebody makes that I'm available to the market for the year, at that point that creates more ETC. But you, you, you would have, since you're updating these values on a monthly rolling basis, whenever that happens, then you can update that ATC. But until then, you're protecting for the existing full amount of existing transmission contracts. Okay, okay, well, um... I guess I will just renew my ask if you could provide these data and then if you could provide the data for each of the elements that Guillermo had on the previous page and a couple of weeks to look at it so we could, you know, really understand it, um, that would be really helpful before we have to submit comments. So that would be my request. Thank yeah, you. That sounds, that sounds good. Thank you, Michelle. Do you have another question in? Yep, go ahead. Tyrone, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Hi, this is Tyrone from pg &E. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, so part of part of where I'm trying to, I have, I guess, some gaps in my knowledge, as um, is really trying to understand because I know there's been questions uh, specifically around the the load assumptions and what some of the other BAs are doing. And so one question that I have is knowing that some BAs are using like a one in 10 and sometimes they're saying one in 20 uh, for their native load assumption. Uh, so that's a forecasted future load. Why is it that the ISO can't do a forecasted future and is suggesting using historical volumes? Well, the, the, the forecasted future I think is, is uh, Tyrone is the, 
is the type of is the granularity of the load forecast. You still have to make certain assumptions about you know what generation is going to serve that load volume. So if you use a one in ten versus a one in twenty or a one in two, is this changing the load amount? So here, what we're trying to do as well is is what's the appropriate generation assumption behind that. Now, what was suggested, I think, here earlier today is is well, maybe let's you know these approaches. You know, just look at the historical import volumes during the more stressed system hours. Um, what we could do is, I think as somebody suggested, is let's look at a load period that is more reflective of something higher than one and two for what um, RA is procured for, you know, plus PRM. I think once you add the, the, TR, the PRM to the, to the RA, it's probably more towards the one in five, but but if you if we use you know, a, a load condition that's like 46,000 megawatts, 47,000 megawatts, and see what's going on during that particular period, that's more of a, you know, a, a, something higher than a one in two. I don't know if that approximates a one in five or, or higher, but you know, we, we we can do that analysis if we look at what happened in a one in ten condition, and and what was the volume of imports there. Otherwise, you have to make some assumptions about you know, where's this stuff coming from. Uh, to serve that load, how much of that load is going to be met by imports? So I hope that helps. But but we, we've committed to to providing data now on let's look at a load day where we have load above a certain amount, and let's see what was the what was the coincident import transfers uh, imports when we close on the imports across these different intertie points during those those, those peak hours, net load peak hours, and, and then using that to potentially represent what you need for native load. Is that higher than RA? Is that Similar, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I, I think that also uh, to that to that same point, Milos, if, if you all are looking at the dispatch that would coincide with a one in five, you know, say like system, that that's when it begins, in my opinion, to start to correlate with the transmission planning study assumptions for system forecast. And that's, you know, because it also yeah. gets to, I think one of the things that we've been asking questions about, and I think Doug mentioned it a little bit earlier is some of the in-area constraints, not just singularly for path 15 or 26, but recognizing there may be some underlying power flow uh, conditions that aren't being accounted for. And so I guess the second question is, how are you all envisioning maybe doing some power flow analysis to support these assumptions? Yeah, thanks Thanks for that, Tyrone. So so the focus at this point has been on the inner ties. We, don't at least at this stage, based on the analysis and some of the the numbers that we've run, to see the loading of Path 26 during different conditions. And as and as um, Guillermo mentioned, you know, the try what we've seen is we haven't seen those loadings uh, even during some of the more stress system conditions in the north to south or the south to north conditions. Um, you know, the overload Path 26. Now you can always have D rates. Uh, on path 26 that are unexpected and, and other internal paths, but but absent those conditions where you have unexpected planned out unplanned outage D rates, we, even during stress system conditions, we haven't seen um, those overloading. So that's why the focus is on on the inner ties here. But then you know we can evolve the framework if needed to look at now internal paths uh, at some point as well. But I don't know if you want to add anything else, uh, Guillermo, to that. No, it's not, it's not necessarily just looking at internal paths. It's recognizing that you could you could put a flow, let's say, on Cobb or uh, on Malin, and it could look like, okay, you're within the, the 3,200 number, but then if you run a series of contingencies and you don't have to run all of them, it may result in some type of underlying constraint. So that, that's I really see, I what see. I think that, yeah, I think the power flow kind of teases yeah. out. And I think it, it, it somewhat feeds into – what you all may be considering what the, the overall for someone who may be seeking an annual, uh, because in the annual process, I'm assuming if, it, if it's kind of following your generation interconnection process, it's also going to look at like a one in five system load. It's going to have some generation dispatch assumptions. So then that way it's kind of lining up and those assumptions are, are you know, what, what seem to be consistent with one another. Yeah, yeah. No, no, fair point. And, and, and I think that that comes back as well bit to this you know counterflow question as well if you're you know flowing more potentially above that based upon the different counterflows. So good point, Tyrone, let us let us 
look into that as well. Appreciate you you know, noting that and, and put it in your comments as well. Send me a note offline as well, more specifically yeah. to what you're thinking, and we'll certainly look at that. Okay, no problem. Thanks, Milos. Thanks, King. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so there is one question in the chat, and then um, we'll go ahead and move on because we do have about 20 more slides to get through in, in less than an hour. So just a reminder to please try to keep your comments succinct and um, not to repeat previous comments. But the last chat question we have here is from Sybil Gieselman from Public Generating Pool. Um, just kind of expanding on Michelle's previous question, uh, what happens when you calculate the ATC and it's negative? For example, total rating minus TRM minus CBM is less than the ATC. You mean so? So, if on a forward basis, if we're trying to based upon the assumptions that we're looking to calculate, uh, if I understood the question, based upon the assumptions, if you look at the total transfer capability, you subtract the existing commitment, you subtract any CBM, et cetera, and that's less than you know that gets you some kind of negative number. That means you you're probably overcommitted on a on a firm basis, and and that will lead to an ATC of zero for that particular time frame. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. But yeah, if the agency is negative at that point, you just uh, you can't make that available for whatever period that is, whether it's a single month or something else. Okay. Thanks, Milos. Okay, and, and so I'll just close out with this one. We don't have to spend too much time on this, but this this was just trying to get the point across that that. There may be an opportunity for us to look at multiple different scenarios or sensitivities, you know, for lack of a better term. You look at approach one, you look at a, a, in, in a different approach, and, and maybe you look at between those different approaches, you're trying to protect for the worst case scenario um, or the average between those three or four scenarios, whatever the resulting numbers are. That's all that this is really trying to say. Is, is just, again, to encourage us to think about it. If we think that there's multiple viable ways of, of um, of, of, of calculating those native load needs uh, that protect for different things, you know, there may be an opportunity to look at those multiple approaches together and, and uh, you know, look at, like I said, some kind of an average or, or, the, or, or protect for the worst case scenario there, um, you know, protect for the most native load. So that's all this is trying to say. In the interest of time, you know, my suggestion would be we, we, we move on to the, to the next set of topics, but uh, I would encourage stakeholders we're very open. To please reach out to us offline. If you have suggestions that some of this discussion sparked and you think that there may be good to look at approximating native loadings in a different way or different scenarios, send that to us. We're certainly open, and I expect here that over the next week to two, we're going to probably in the next week, we're going to publish some additional data as an addendum here based on some of the suggestions that we've heard. You know, with no counterflows, what does this look like approach to that again we'll just walk through? What is uh, what were the conditions if we look at a load scenario that's above a certain threshold? I think we talked about about 46, about 47,000. What happens simultaneously on the inner ties at those points uh, uh, during that condition? And just you know, trying to try to see what those bookends are. And are we getting similar numbers or are we getting kind of disparity, sizable disparities between one scenario versus another? So we'll we'll look to publish some addendum. Uh, or an addendum that includes a couple of more of these iterations for you to consider. And I think we can also extend in the comment period a bit to give you time to consider that. Uh, but in the interest of time, if you're all okay with it, let's move on to the next component of this design. At least I want to get through these so that you have a bit more detail and information uh, to consider as you're crafting comments. But yeah, if, I'll just go quickly through these because I think we talked through them as we were walking through the other elements. But another important component of the ATC calculation is the transmission reliability margin. That's governed by the NERC standard that you see there, and it allows you to set aside transmission capacity for uh, across the horizons for different types of uncertainty that may materialize. Load forecast changes, uncertainty in system topology, such as transmission outages that you can protect for. If you don't know of an outage when you're calculating this ATC 13 months out or you know, 10 months from now, you don't have any outages on the land but you know that there's a risk of outage because every year during particular August or something like that, there's a certain risk of outage. You can account for that as TRM. As you get closer in time, you can release that to the extent that it's not materializing uh, as expected. You know, there's no outages that you can release the TRM and it creates more ATCs. 
but you can also account for some margins for loop flow and other components as well. So if we go into the next slide, just to highlight as well, uh, the consideration of a capacity benefit margin. As I mentioned earlier, this is another margin that, again, reduces the ATC, uh, but it's got a limited use. You can set aside transmission at the inner side uh, for delivery of imports in emergency conditions, and the trigger here is an EEA2, an emergent energy emergency alert level two or higher. And as I noted before, um, you know, some entities have this margin, others don't. It's a factor of how conservative or how protective you may have been in some of your other assumptions and uncertainties that you've covered. But that will be part of the question here too. Is there a need based upon how we craft the other components? Is there a need for an additional uh, CBM? And is there room for a CBM? Because there may not be room after you do certain things, uh, certain assumptions uh, on, on particular points. But that's another consideration here that all works together with the other components. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so just briefly then to touch on this concept of uh, posting the ACC, but again, across the 13-month horizon, we will be looking to make updates on a monthly basis to update this ATC, but the ATC would also be updated every time somebody reserves it. You reduce that ATC, so it's visible for entities out, you know, do, is there a room here or no? for a particular month and they know whether to submit a request. But then you would update the information as well as, as you get new outages, you know, that can reduce your TTC. If you now know of an outage 10 months out, that reduces the TTC and that may reduce your ATC then that's available for that month out. And then you're accounting for, for whenever, anytime somebody reserves ATC, that now becomes an existing commitment. It just switches buckets, reduces your ATC and now moves into that existing commitment bucket that you carry all the way through into, into real time, into the day ahead. Okay, so if we go into the next slide, this is, I think, the next slide is, I think, just a graphical representation. Again, based upon the approach that you take for calculating native load needs, you would have better information. The closer you come in time across this 13-month horizon, the closer in time you are as you're updating this, this ATC, the better information you have. So if you, for example, use your, are, are accounting for native load needs uh, based upon your historical resource adequacy showing. As you get closer in time, this month one and month two, you know, now you have updated RA import showings, and now that can potentially update your native load component. You also have updated TTC, you have updated outages information that can inf inform, again, your total transfer capability across the path. Point is, as you get closer in time and you're recalculating this, you have the ability to update those assumptions based on the most relevant and up-to-date data. Okay, let's go, let me see here. Um, can you just go to one side? I don't know what's coming up next, just so I know. Okay, so next is daily ATC, but let me just pause before we move on to this one, if there are any more questions, and keep in mind the time. I'm just trying to touch at least on all of these, and, and um, if, if there are any questions on this before we move on to the next one. Okay, let's go to the next one. No questions in here. Okay. So just moving now to the daily horizon, uh, we're proposing effectively now to calculate ATC in the daily horizon ahead of the day ahead market close, kind of on a, on a three-day rolling basis ahead of the time of flow or, or effectively two days prior to the day ahead market close for a particular day, and you'll see that illustrated in the next graphic. I know it's a bit confusing, but I think this is consistent with what other entities do in the West and what other ISOs and RTOs that have this type of a process do. They calculate this on a daily horizon. Their processes, I think, allow for uh, up to seven days ahead of you know, effectively the time of flow that you can reserve this or, or ahead of, I guess, the day ahead market close. But um, you know, we're at least our starting point here, because we may have some better information with the ISO has uh, on a you know, three days prior to flow, we think that that may be more appropriate. We're certainly open to suggestions from stakeholders, how long should this window be? But the idea here is that you're now carrying on the AT, some of the ATC information uh, or the ATC components from the monthly horizon. You're carrying that into the daily horizon. And now in the daily time frame, you know, as you get closer in time, that same pattern of you have better information, you may have now some outages whether planned or unplanned, that came in, and that now those D rates 
you know, inform your TTC. You may have to reduce that TTC. You, you, some of the margin may have accounted for that, so you may be able to adjust the margins. But also, as you get into this daily time frame, you continue to protect for um, any ATC that's been reserved in advance in that monthly horizon, and that's your existing transmission commitment. So in the daily horizon, there may be opportunities for some additional ATC as conditions change. You may not need a TRM or a CBM, depending on the conditions, or if you see certain condition changes on the grid, you may it may reduce your TTC, which may reduce your available capacity uh, further down. So let's just go one more slide and then I'll get to you, Michelle, uh, in your question, because I think this closes out the daily thing. But, um, and we're also malleable here in terms of does this type of a time frame work for the daily ATC horizon as well as when the daily ATC is posted. But this just tries to illustrate um, when that daily ATC would be posted. And, and effectively, if you're looking at the day of flow being the yellow one, the yellow box, you're effectively posting ATC for that day of flow where that green box is day, day ahead plus two uh, because the day ahead is the, is the blue box. So just to illustrate it in real days, uh, for Sunday, uh, you're, you're posting the day ahead, the, the ATC on Thursday for Sunday. At the same time, you're updating the ATC, um, you know, for, for, for Friday. So it's a kind of a rolling three-day basis. You're posting the, you know, two days, uh, three days prior to flow, you're posting that ATC, but it can be accessed on Saturday is the last day that you can access the ATC for Sunday prior to the day have market close. Okay, let me pause here as well, uh, and, and we can open it up for some questions. Uh, I think Michelle has a hand up. Hey, this is Michelle from the CPC. Hey, I'm concerned about this daily release of the ATC. So um, the way I'm seeing this is the only time people will want to reserve this is when they're forecasting some stress system conditions. So for example, you might see a heat wave coming next week and so you want to make sure that you could wheel from the northwest to the southwest. So those stress system conditions would be precisely the times that California might need to go procure or procure additional imports at the ties. And I'm just curious, are you imagining that California, I mean, if you think of this in the context of EDAM and you need to go out and, um, you know, cure a, a resource sufficiency de deficiency, I mean, we don't really have an entity to do that. And yet every other entity could potentially go do that and procure the wheels. Do you not see this providing sort of unequal treatment to California versus other load serving entities and also sort of a reliability issue for California? Yeah, thanks, Michelle, for that. I, uh, not necessarily. I think this all depends on, on, you know, did you protect native load sufficiently in, you know, when you were calculating those native load needs? Because there's still a native load need component to this. The question is, did you protect for those those types of conditions? And if you did, then there's less ATC that's available for others to wheel. So um, maybe you right? guys could talk so, a little bit about how you're proposing to calculate this daily ATC then. Yeah, so you would, you would, depending on how you're calculating native load needs in the monthly horizon, I think you would look to carry that on into the daily horizon. So if you're basing it upon squarely RA needs and, and resource adequacy imports, then at that point, you are just effectively carrying those, the RA that's been shown, you're protecting for that going into the daily horizon. Um, right. I think what could but be. Let's say everyone sees a heat wave, yeah. California has no ability to try to go get more imports and reserve that capacity, right? But external entities do. Right, but there's, then there's other components as well where, where transmission has been set aside to account for some uh, level of load uncertainty within the TRM. I think we talked about that when we were in the TRM, uh, on the TRM slides, that you're protecting as well for some um, change in load forecast and as you get closer in time here, we, we have a little bit better information that we can look to protect for that. Um, but you would set that aside as a, as a TRM. I, I think there's, there's ultimately limits to how much here you can change in that daily horizon. I think, I think what we would need to consider at some point is, do you have 
a contract for that capacity. And if you do, then there may be the ability to set this aside uh, in advance. But but otherwise, I think it, it may be a bit more challenging. So, so in the daily time frame, do external entities have to have a contract? Yeah, I think we'll get to that in the next couple of slides, how you access ATC. But yeah, there, there's a requirement that if you're going to access the ATC, there's a demonstration of a contractual arrangement. Okay, well, I'll just leave it at a comment that I'm concerned that yeah. this, um, this disadvantages California and has some fairly severe implications for reliability. Uh, thanks yeah. so much. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, thank you, Michelle. And I think, you know, I think what others do as well is, is, is your, did you, did you set aside sufficient transmission capacity for native load? You, know, you may not be able to do that in every single condition where something materializes, uh, but I think, I think let's consider what may be those tools. You know, and, and if you didn't protect native load and now you're in a one in 50 scenario, you know, I, I don't know that we can just set aside transmission for a one in 50 load, I'm, I'm being extreme. But, but that's, I think that's the push and pull here, is, is what's reasonable to set aside for native load based on the assumptions. So great point, Michelle, and let's, let's keep thinking about that, um, how those conditions change, and if, if there's additional needs, how is that accessible? So thank you for that. Okay. So, yeah, and so that's, that's exactly where we're going next, then, is accessing ATC. So now we've calculated this ATC across different horizons. And what we're putting forward is a framework where ATC is accessed similar to, I think, what others do in the OAT framework, but on a first-come, first-served basis through the submission of a request. You submit a request, and we didn't go into the detail in the straw proposal, but the ultimate design of the request process is, I think we wanted to just get this framework across, and then we can decide to define it further in the next iteration. But it's, you submit a request um, in, to, to reserve that ATC, and, and that entity that's in order to access that ATC, we think there needs to be a demonstration. There needs to be some criteria here, because I think what we ultimately want to avoid is whoever is quickest to the trigger and, and pulls that, presses that button first to get the request a second earlier, you know, it may not go to the entity that actually needs that capacity. Uh, and so the thought here is that there will be certain requirements that need to be demonstrated in order to access the ATC. And I think this is where Justin was asking earlier. But there will be there's kind of three requirements, but or, or one of these has to be met. But you've executed a firm power supply contract to serve load. If you have a contract already in place, then you can access this. If you have a firm supply contract that's maybe conditioned upon uh, obtaining that wheeling through scheduling priority, the high priority across the ISO system, you can access it. Or if you own that resource um, that that you're looking to wheel, and then if the request is approved then you know, there will also be a requirement to prepay for, for transmission. And the idea here is that, again, if these requirements can be met, then the entity has access to that transmission, and this ensures that the entity that really needs that uh, limited capacity uh, accesses it and, and is able to serve load uh, by wheeling through our system. So if we go to the next slide just to see what's on it. Uh... Yeah, okay. So, so then, and I think we can pause for some questions right after this, but, um, you know, the, ultimately, if entities are able to reserve that ATC, the wheeling through priority is established based upon or for the duration of that underlying supply contract. So if an entity has a supply contract that's a 6 by 16 that they're looking to wheel through the system uh, for the month, then, you know, they've got a 6 by 16, they've got priority during that a particular time frame of a six by sixteen contract. In the daily time frame, you know, the sixteen hour product, you've got priority during that sixteen hour period. Uh, and the thought here is and, and we describe it and we want to seek some feedback on this, but we're trying to equate this as well a bit. Uh, and, and this plays a role when it comes to the compensation framework in particular. But that the uh, minimum kind of duration of of, the, of of a contract that can kind of support accessing uh, ATC is is kind of in a in the monthly horizon. It's kind of a six by four contract. I think you know, we we can get some feedback from stakeholders. What are the what are these types of contracts? Are they usually six days or can they be also be five days? But the idea here is that somebody is just seeking uh, you know to take monthly ATC and they really only have a two by 
12 contract where they only get have it for two days, 12 hours a day, or one day a week, that takes off ATC that's not acceptable to others. And the idea is to make it available for those contracts that, that are longer in duration that, that are going to utilize that ATC. Uh, we've also put forward the, con, the framework that if now you're in, you know, there's limited ATC across a particular inner tie. And when there's limited ATC, you may have more requests that are vying for that ATC than, than there is ATC. And so the thought is leveraging something that's common and, and, and also applied in the OAT world, but then there's windows um, where requests uh, are submitted and are kind of just sitting idle along with other requests. And they effectively compete with each other for the limited ATC if, um, if there's not enough to meet everybody's needs. And in that context, uh, the, the longer duration request, uh, you know, or the one that's got the longer um, underlying supply contract would get access to the ATC over, you know, one that's got a lower duration contract. So, for example, you can see there in the last slide, a, a wheeling through entity that's seeking monthly ATC, uh, you know, would get effectively would out-compete a, if it's 6 by 16, would out-compete a uh, request that's, that only has a supporting six by four contract. And the idea again here is it allows use for those that, 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 that are gonna maximize use of that service. And as you get to the compensation framework that we talk about a little bit later, it also allows for um, you know, bringing in that, maximizing the, the revenue that, that goes to the transmission provider for making its system available. But the idea here is that, uh, and what we seek feedback on is particularly this concept of this window, how long should these requests, particularly in the monthly time horizon, how long should these windows be? Is it a day? Is it multiple days? Because we do ultimately recognize that entities need some uh, need certainty fairly quickly of whether they're getting that ATC or not. And so, um, you know, we certainly appreciate some feedback from those wheeling through entities. How long should this particular window be where they're all kind of commingling with each other and ultimately competing for limited access. So I see Lindsay has a question. Go ahead, Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay Schleckway from NV Energy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I have a question about this window and I was kind of, so I was wondering, um, did you consider at all if you're gonna collect um, the request during a certain window, did you at all consider, um, I guess just, just giving it to the first, um, the, the first submittal, basically establishing a queue. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's the that's the starting point. Uh, I think on the last slide we noted kind of it's a queue, first come, first serve. But I think even under the um, even under the out framework, you know, some shorter term requests are conditional for a period of time so that they can compete with each other when there's limited ATC. And so that was the similar thought here is. If, if if there's plenty of ATC and, and and there's no need to for parties to compete, not enough requests, then yeah, the first come first serve gets it. But when you know if there's multiple entities that now are vying for the same 50 megawatts, so there's that window of time where they're competing against each other, similar to the preemption and competition process that I think occurs under the oath framework in the short-term horizon. It's just that I think here we'll want to be careful what those windows are because we want to provide certainty sooner than later to some of these entities that are that are you know re submitting their request i don't know if that okay. helps lindsay but that that's the thought is first come first serve but being enhanced with this window that you know if if, if it's just two of you then then you know the first one gets it but but if, if if there's multiple entities that are kind of vying for limited space then there's that competition but it, once you're out of that window then you're clear you, you have that atc okay that helps I guess, understand your, your logic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, consider again here, equating it to that preemption competition process that occurs in the DO, where you're, you're ultimately the, the one with the longer duration gets it, and, and there's a conditional period where this is, but just what's that appropriate conditional period? Because we don't want to, I understand we probably don't want to make it too long for entities to not have that certainty. Okay. Let me just do a time check here. Uh, we're about 3.30. If you all don't mind, let me just move through a few of these slides here just to introduce the concepts and the framework and we'll, and we'll, we'll pause. Uh, so the next is the 
long-term process. And then after that is the compensation. So I'm gonna ask Catalin, I'm just gonna introduce this Catalin for a second, but then Catalin, I'm just gonna see if you can maybe walk through this to make sure we leave a little bit of time on the, the compensation framework to introduce that concept. But the idea here, folks, behind this is that, you know, we've established up to this point that you can access ATC in a monthly horizon as well as a daily horizon. That's, that's short term, less than a year. If an entity wants to establish priority on a long-term basis for a year or longer, then uh, we would provide the ability that similarly that entities have in other systems of, of and this is in yearly increments, uh, that you can come in and, and effectively be studied, and that study can identify whether or not you can be accommodated or whether an upgrade is needed, and providing a pathway to an upgrade to provide that, that higher level of certainty. So with that, let me turn it over to Catalin uh, to walk through the uh, presentation. Thank you, Milos. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. For the uh, long-term request, uh, what we are thinking is that we will um, allow them to come in um, along and we're going to get studied along with our generation interconnections. Um, basically, the commitment that the ISO has made is on deliverability for our generators and the imports is MIG. Those are done on a year ahead basis and we would be studying all the um, requests for, for willing along with our deliverability studies and they will be mingled in with the GIF. So what that means is that we would have a cluster type study. We will have an open window where this request will be coming in. And, and then we would be doing the studies um, through our um, regular GIF interconnection studies. Um, if some of you may have uh, followed the ISOs stakeholder process last year for MIC enhancements. We did have one item that if we would be moving forward uh, in, the, in the willing process to allow external LSEs or, or any external entities to pay for ex transmission expansions, then we would actually allow ISO internal LSEs to pay for, for, for these expansions in the same manner as well. So for the long term, we would be opening up for internal and external people to make requests to upgrade uh, the tra transmission um, basically at their own cost. Next slide, please. So how would this be working? Uh, again, we, we do have um, a cluster uh, study. Um, you would submit a request in, in that cluster and then uh, we, you would be responsible for the study cost. Uh, we do have a phase one and a phase two um, study there. Um, you, you would be required to submit a financial posting um, after the phase one if you want to move forward. Um, we, we do include both reliability and deliverability assessments and you know generally is expected that you would be getting with the 90 to 120 days um, for the deposit and agreement execution. Next slide, please. So after uh, we complete these studies, uh, we will be sharing those results uh, with, with, the, with the requester. And if the, the transmission uh, is, is actually needed for, for an ISO reliability, economic, or public policy reason, the ISO will have the first choice of moving forward with those projects. In that case, uh, we would be refunding the, the study cost to the, the requester. Um, if the ISO does not find a need um, for, for this expansion, um, then the requester will have an opportunity to pay for those upgrades. Next slide, please. So as I said before, to the extent this transmission is only needed to accommodate uh, this, this extra request, um, long-term willing priority um, or for internal resources for their own MEEC use, then the requester will have the uh, possibility to pursue those upgrades. The requester will be responsible for funding the cost of the upgrades um, and it will be treated as a merchant transmission line. 
And, and I guess uh, the question here that, that Milos uh, put in here is about uh, should they be receiving congestion revenue rights for, for that or not? That, uh, upon discussion, maybe you can submit some, some comments um, about that. I think that's all I had for the long term. Can we have next slide, please? So if anybody has any questions about, you know, how this would be done on, on a long-term basis. Um, hey, Catalan, this is Deb. Can you go back to the slide? Sorry, I thought this got fixed. If you are a merchant transmission line, you would get CRRs for the merchant transmission line. I thought that, that question got out of there, so sorry about that. Okay, thank you, Debbie. We do have a question in queue. Tyrone, your line is unmuted. You may go ahead. Thank you. Hey, Catalan, Tyrone from PG&E. My quick question is, we had asked this as a part of the TPP, uh, and they've pointed us back to this particular initiative, but my question to you is, is the ISO able to do similar to what Milos has done with the monthly and the uh, the monthly stuff? If you could do a preliminary assessment on like Malin and Nob or or Malin and um, Palo Verde to see what's available using this process. Yeah, again, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. So basically- Preliminary the, the, assessment of what's available because we they're identified yeah. using different okay. historical, yeah. So we're just trying to say, if you did it now using this, what would your yeah. studies kind of show is available on a long-term basis on those major paths? Yes, uh, let me let me repeat what I said before. When, when you come in and, and you put a request in, you would be in the last cluster. So whatever is the next cluster is gonna be cluster 15. I think your question is, is there anything left after cluster 14? Well, cluster 14 is ongoing and, and people <clears throat> can drop out after the phase one and they can drop out after phase two. So it's it's really a moving target. Uh, but, but I guess after we finish the cluster 14 phase two, uh, there may be an opportunity to, to decide what's available and what not. Again, these are all gonna be a single study so it's not just the, what's available based on MIG, it's what's available based on MIG and existing Q cluster studies is after the last cluster. In any one year when you will be coming in and you'll be asking for these requests, you would be in the same cluster as the generation interconnection uh, people in that cluster. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I, think, I think I understand that the assumptions change and there's a moving target. I guess what I'm asking is, are you all similar to what's, because I would assume even the, the historical assumptions that were shared previously, that's going to change as well. So I'm not saying it's, again, it's not a, a fixed number. It's just, I, I'm just wondering if you all would consider doing a preliminary assessment based on the best information you have available. It's not saying that that's exactly what's going to be available, but it's just saying, hey, preliminary assessment, it shows X amount of megawatts here. I'm not saying to do all the inner ties, but just the major ones that similar to what Milos has done with the monthly process. Yeah, this is Milos. And Tyrone, just to me, what, what I think, correct me if I'm wrong, what I think you're getting at is kind of providing some indication on the planning in a long-term basis, you know, is anything that's coming in at Malin practically going to need an upgrade or, or not? Is that yeah. kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, and it's just, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm clear. I understand stuff changes all the time, assumptions load, but it's just saying, hey, using the methodology, as we currently understand, preliminary numbers, this is an estimate, hey, if you go through the process, there's no guarantee it's gonna be there. But it's just to preliminarily share what those numbers might be. Yeah, thank you, Tyrone. Um, we don't have that data readily available, so we'll, we'll have to figure out if that data will be readily available and when. Thank you for the question. There are no additional questions in queue. All right, now back to me and 
All right, I realized there wasn't a camera, so let's do that. So this is the last topic of the day, and we've got about 20 minutes. I committed to somebody to, to provide 30 minutes at least to this, but I apologize we didn't get to that. But we'll get through this. I'll get through these couple of slides quickly, and then we really want to get your feedback. And if people want to share a, alternate perspectives or alternate frameworks, we certainly welcome that to the compensation framework. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. So just want to set the stage on, on there's two slides on this. On what's happening today. Today, the, the wheeling through scheduling priorities framework that I talked about at the beginning of the meeting, transmission is paid when scheduled. An entity may establish wheeling through priority for the month, but really they're just paying for when they schedule that. And they may schedule that just a handful of times through the month, depending upon needs and conditions in the system um, based on the, on the supply stack. And while priority, like I said, is established for the month, they're getting their high priority wheels, those wheels that meet those requirements, 45 days advance, they're paying for transmission the same way as a low priority wheel effectively is paying for transmission. When scheduled, it's the same rate that applies, whether it's a high priority or low priority, you only pay when you schedule. So that's, you know, I think there, there's a, with the wheeling through priorities framework, I don't think that that necessarily reflects the value that a high priority wheel uh, provides to entities that are wheeling through the system. And it's just a construct of, of the challenges with the current rate structure that we have in place, I believe, in part. So let's go to the next slide, illustrate just the proposal, and then I think we can open it for stakeholders to share their perspectives and, and maybe other ideas to consider. But the, the framework that we're thinking about is that the compensation for a high priority wheel is based upon the underlying um, underlying duration of the supply contract. We only have one rate today in place. We have the, the transmission access charge that's, that's right there. You can see on the first bullet, it's the same as the wheeling access charge uh, effectively. But it's just one rate that we have. We don't distinguish between different types of priorities or, or services that may be offered. And so trying to work within that structure, recognizing that we're trying to move away from an interim framework uh, and, and that you know, potentially opening up a rate structure, maybe a, a lengthier process. We're, we're thinking about, is there, how can we make this work? Is there a way to make this work under the current rate design? And so what we're putting forward is a framework where effectively uh, the wheeling access charge or this rate would only be applied, would be applied based upon the underlying duration of the contract that's supporting the wheeling through priority. So if an entity is, has acquired the ATC to support a 6 by 16 contract that's wheeling through our system, then that the compensation would be prepayment of the transmission charge based on that rate for that 6 by 16 duration. Moving away from just when it's scheduled, but rather you're paying now, you have established that wheeling through priority for that time frame, you're paying for that wheeling through priority whether or not you use it, um, and it's on that underlying duration of the contract. And we think that I think that this is kind of on par with, uh, you know, today how load-serving entities using RAM ports pay for transmission because transmission today, the transmission access charge is paid based upon the gross load of a load-serving entity. And if entities have an RAM port uh, that is effectively self-scheduled and under the current rules and it is serving load, it's contributing to that gross load um, amount that ultimately is paid for um, to the tax charge. And so in our minds, it's effectively kind of comparable treatment in that the RA import is paying for the tax based upon the gross load and that RA input is contributing to that gross load, uh, you know, on its six by 16 basis. And they're paying the same as, and the wheel through would be paying effectively the same. So there, if it's a six by 16 wheel through, it's paying for that ability to wheel and establish that priority on that same underlying supply basis. So that's the rationale for this framework under the current um, rate structure design. And we'd certainly uh, be open to hearing from other stakeholders. Um, are there different designs that can be considered here? Are there different ways of thinking about this, valuing uh, the high priority framework? We think that this is better than the framework that's in place today, which is just paying when it's scheduled. It could be once or twice or three times. Whereas here they're paying the transmission access charge and, and according it that value for the duration of that the ATC is reserved. Um, but but we certainly be open to alternate frameworks that stakeholders may want to put forward or, or, or share. So let me pause here. Let's open it up for questions and see what uh, stakeholders may, may say if there's anything you want to share 
uh, with others. Okay, so we do have a chat question from uh, TJ Vargas at DWR, just asking if you could discuss the practicality of transmission upgrade requests compared to the need uh, to wheels to the need of wheel throughs. Um, and just to clarify, any transmission upgrade would take eight to twelve years. Are any entities doing many wheel throughs? Um, are they looking that far into the future? Yeah, let, let, let's maybe let's maybe take that question after we wrap up this uh, compensation discussion. Just just while it's fresh on people's mind, we can come back to the transmission here uh, next. If, if once once question sees on this topic, but great question. We can talk about the practicality of the timelines and and when you're going to find out whether or not an upgrade is needed. I think that's the more important piece. Right, of knowing fairly soon, but we'll come back to the practicality of some of the and the timelines of, of different types of upgrades. Okay, we do have Michelle Keto in queue. Hey, this is Michelle Keto from the CPC. Um, did you consider any adders? Because people are only going to want the wheels during stress system conditions, and it seems odd for us to charge just the flat whack rate, um, you know, across the year. I mean, people are only going to want it during the you know, three stressed months and probably just at the on peak hours. I mean, what's to stop somebody from asking for just the four availability assessment hours and just getting it for the WAC charge? It doesn't it doesn't seem quite right. I'm having trouble with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the nuance here is that they will be paying for it, whether or not they use it. That's the, that's the, the primary distinction. But but fair point. I think the challenge we ran with the adder is justifying a particular adder, um, you know, volume. I think some stakeholders suggested that in the past, if I remember correctly, that they may be willing to pay an adder. I think we're certainly open to that. If there's a su suggestion on what that adder may be based upon, um, you know, we can certainly consider that. And let me just ask, Michelle, under your framework, under your suggestion, is the is the transmission being paid for with that adder only when scheduled, or or is it still kind of just building upon this framework of of the the underlying supply contract paying for it, but you're paying for not just the tax, you're paying for the tax well, plus. It seems like it, it, you should pay for all that you reserve. So if you have reserved 24 by 7, you should pay for 24 by 7. I don't think it's the just, I mean, so I, I'd say the, the whole amount. And I guess I'm under, not understanding why a um, an adder is not possible since, you know, California customers pay the whole whack and then whatever comes in for uh, wheeling or exports just gets offset, and then the next year you either, you know, just decrease the whack a little bit. So it almost doesn't really matter what the adder is. I mean, it should have some theoretical basis. I mean, we could look to external balancing authorities. I mean, have you looked at what adders are used, you know, for seasonal and for time periods in our neighboring balancing authorities? That would be a good place to start, I would guess. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, I it think, also just, sorry, just it also has the added benefit. I mean, what we really are trying to do is have the cost re reflect, you know, the scarcity of it, right? So it would, I, I mean, I guess most entities, I, I mean, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, we're looking at scarcity pricing and people have been making strong arguments for that. I mean, it seems like you should have a similar framework in the transmission system or, or we're really disconnected here, right? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, fair point, Michelle, I think we can certainly consider uh, different adders I think that the, the question there is, and, and just to in, within your context, is you know, if if transmission is valued during certain periods of the day, would load also be paying for that transmission? Are you envisioning that load would be valuing that transmission as well during those periods of the day, or are you just saying that wheel throughs should be paying for higher rates because during higher periods well, of the day is, I, is, is yeah? I guess here's my premise. Uh, California load pays for it regardless of whether they use it right now, right? So we pay um, for the entire year, even though we really have built the system for the peak, you know, a one in five peak on September, right? So um, so we, we already do pay for it that way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, it, that, that's right. I, but but it, just wanna make sure that that's not unique to what any other transmission provider does. I mean, they, 
same right, thing happens on, on their most, system. Most other transmission providers do have, um, I mean, do have uh, rates that reflect um, the time period and the season, right? Yeah, they have different products as well, but also I think that's also reflected in a higher load charge as well, but compared to some of those those uh, other charges, those other rates. Yeah. But, but yeah, we can certainly yeah, I mean, we well, can certainly look at we can certainly look at an adder. That, that's a good suggestion. I think um, you know we, we'd appreciate in comments, you know, if, if there are any ideas for how to divide those adders. What we have looked at is looking at you know what's the difference in rates. Um, on other transmission provider systems between a firm and non-firm product or, or peak versus an off-peak product to the extent that those transmission providers just differentiate between peak and off-peak product. So we've looked at some of that stuff um, as well, and I think we can certainly consider it. We, we certainly appreciate just some other ideas on, on how to derive that. Is it, is it you know, applying a similar ratio or, or something else? But you know, good, good suggestion, and, and we can certainly open to, to considering it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Isabella, do we have others in the queue? We do. Yes. Yes. Meg, go ahead. Your line is unmuted. This is Meg McDonald for Six Cities. Can you hear me okay? It's a little faint. Um, we can't hear you that well. I'll do my best. I'm on my computer audio here, um, and I'll be brief. Um, I would echo the request that Michelle just made for the KISO to um, maybe do some comparisons with how other transmission providers uh, may escalate rates for certain time periods that are of high value. We think there's um, a lot of value to considering the concept of an adder or a scaler. Um, within this framework and um you know speaking just just for my group we'll we'll do a little homework and try and look at that as well um i had one question uh which is uh whether you could elaborate a bit more on this idea of providing parity with ra imports it sounds like you think that 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 uh charging um wheeling transactions the WAC based on the term of the underlying contract is is somehow similar to um, how gross load is or how uh, how ISO entities are charged the tax based on their gross load, and I yeah. have not understood that there is any connection between how KISO LSEs are charged the tax. I think it I think their gross load is calculated irrespective of any input. Um, but if there's something that I'm missing there, um, or if you can help me make this connection, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me give it a shot, and then maybe Anthony can help me if I'm if I'm a bit off. But uh, you know, as we were looking at this framework, and how can we how can we rationalize it and justify this type of framework at FERC potentially? We were looking at you know the fact that uh, load pays tax based upon its effectively gross load amount and the RA imports that are contracted and self-scheduled and delivered, you know, if it's a six by 16, it's directly contributing to that gross load, you know, for that six by 16 period that it's, that it's effectively serving it. And so the thought here was that a wheeling through transaction uh, is effectively on par and, and paying the same uh, if they had a six by 16 contract, same as, as a, um, RA import contributing to the gross load amount. That's that's a six by sixteen. The, the, the gross load is paying for effectively that the tax across the six by sixteen, and and the wheel through here would also pay that six by sixteen. Now that doesn't necessarily account for, you know, if we want to go further and look at the adder, I think that's got a bit of a different rationale. The question is how you structure it, but but the idea there, I think, with the adder is there's a higher value here in peak versus off peak periods, if I understood correctly, you know, with considering an adder, not just because it's a wheel, but it's because it's a period of time, whether it's peak hours or off peak hours. But you know, I, I can see certainly us considering that as well, but th that's the rationale for, for this particular framework. And let me just check Anthony, did I mess that up or, or is there anything you wanna add to, to that rationale? All right, I, I, I'll 
we can hear you, Anthony. If, uh, you might be on mute. You might be on mute, but I'll I'll take that as a okay. Okay. Um, Anthony is unmuted. Um, I'm wondering if maybe his device is muted. Yeah, I think he's in the office, and 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 some of the new headsets that we have don't lend themselves. Yeah, they're a little tricky sometimes. But yeah, the, 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 I did that that's the rationale that was that was there, uh, Meg. And, and like I said, we're certainly open uh, for alternate frameworks. I think a potential adder could work. I think the question there is going to be, is uh, you know, is there a parity issue potentially if if transmission is valued, transmission service is valued differently in peak and off peak periods, uh, does that apply across the board or not? But, but you know, a fair point, and we can certainly consider. Uh, the, the, that that or concept and anything you can do to help do any suggestions just let us know feel free to reach out to us offline and we'll we'll start digging in as well thank you very much Nilesh. all right i'm not seeing any other questions or comments in the chat and i don't see anyone in the queue yeah. so did maybe, you maybe we go can back go back to, to develop now to, yeah maybe we can go back to that question that was in the chat uh and then if others have questions that come back to this just want to make sure we we give it if it's the last question. I think the question I think the question was if I can paraphrase. I think the question was um, uh, you know providing some sense of how long does it really take to to develop an upgrade. If somebody submits a request now, it's studied in the cluster. I think what we put in the slide is you know within 90 to 120 days of executing the agreement and the deposit, we'll give you a sense of whether an upgrade is needed or not. And if an upgrade is needed. I think the timing depends upon the nature of the upgrade, but let me just turn it over to Robert or Catalin. If you can just give some estimation, realistic estimation of, to give folks a sense of how long does it take, at least historically on the ISO system, to get an upgrade through, depending on the nature of the upgrade. Yeah, thank you, Milos. Um, most of the upgrades in the ISO systems, um, a new line usually takes anywhere from five to 10 years. Um, if it's their reconductoring, maybe it takes, you know, three to five years. I'm not sure if anything else less takes than that, maybe a re-rate. Um, so that's, those are just some general timelines. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. Hopefully that addressed the question uh, for the person in the chat. So um, if there are no other questions, maybe we can just move to close out here. Um, is about to the next slide. Just want to make sure folks have the next steps in mind, and some of them may be changing based on what we, what we talked about today. So let, let's go. So I think the the comment deadline currently, as we have it, is the 25th. But the, we did commit to during the call today. Let us publish the data that we agreed to to publish regarding the two approaches that we shared. But let us also update the analysis with uh, a couple of the additional scenarios that we talked about. The one scenario is. Let's look at a high low day that its uh, load is above 46,000 megawatts or so and, and see what the simultaneous imports are at the different key intertype points. I think we can use the same ones we used here. Um, and then the second scenario is let's also, that analysis that Guillermo shared, let's take out counterflows from it and just see what values that that uh, give us as well, absent counterflows. Um, and we can publish that and then uh, and then see what uh, I think we can provide as well um, one or two more weeks, probably two more weeks, depending on when we publish this uh, comments extension so that you can have now the breadth of that information and, and helping share some feedback. And are there, hopefully what that's gonna spur is, are those the right approaches? And if not, are there different ones? And, and what also we've been talking about as we've been going through this discussion today and probably after the comments come in, it may be worthwhile for us to consider a, a more dedicated workshop squarely on the ATC and the different components. And now having some of this data uh, on the native load needs, really having a more direct discussion and focused discussion for a bit longer on what are the appropriate assumptions and we can get into the TRM and CBM components and how those could be derived and needed. But, but that may be also a next step after we get some of your comments is, is dedicating a workshop to, to more this more technical discussion on deriving ATC now that we'll have hopefully robust data set with a different set of assumptions that can be informing. So I think those are the next steps. I'm not gonna go beyond this. You know, I think ultimately our goal is to, to and target is to go to the March board 
uh, for decision. But I think we have a little bit of wiggle room here, um, having set this groundwork to uh, spend a bit more time talking about the ATC, because that's really the critical component here. There's these other pieces that we talked about as well, but what drives that ATC and trying to find that balance in the in how do you derive it and uh, based on all the different permutations and assumptions. And with this workshop, with this meeting, and hopefully the paper as well, we now have a better understanding among all of us, the different components, and I think that's gonna help us now in, in, in that next stage of figuring out you know, what's the right assumption? Because everybody knows what a TRM is now, CBM, native load components. So I think I think those are the next steps. Us publishing these updated scenarios with an addendum uh, will extend the comment deadline, which is give us another week or so just to publish this stuff, and, and then we'll announce the, the extension. And then um, and then we'll look to get your comments and then probably plan a workshop on, on ATC. So uh, I see, Michelle, you have your hand up. Uh, Close, take, take us away here towards the end. Hey, this is Michelle. I'm just looking at your March 2023, and I just want to confirm that this is an item just for the California ISO board. It's not a joint board issue, right? Because it says joint here. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. I think we proposed in the, in the proposal that it be a board decision, but we're seeking comment on that. I know that in phase one of the initiative, stakeholders expressed the desire, or at least um, uh, external entities express the desire that this be a joint um, session. Uh, so in, in the paper, we're, we're identifying it based on the terms of the current uh, uh, board um, outline that it's, it's an ISO board element, but I think we're certainly seeking some comment on that from stakeholders. Okay, but so when you say joint board, you're just saying it would be in, a, in an advisory role at a joint yeah. board meeting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Isabella, let me, before you go to next up, let me just, again, express our gratitude to everybody for taking the time and sticking with us a bit here in the afternoon. Uh, let us follow up on those next steps of publishing that analysis plus the updated two scenarios. We'll extend the comment deadline, and that hopefully then gives you time to you know, provide robust comments. Feel free to reach to us offline if you have any ideas or suggestions, particularly on the compensation or anything else that you've heard. We're certainly open to meeting and, and, and hearing other ideas here and get a head start on, on the next iteration of what should we be thinking about. So we're certainly open and please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you everybody for taking the time. Isabella, I'll turn it over to you to take us to the end here. Thanks again. Thanks, Milos, and thanks everyone for your participation today. Um, just as a reminder, the materials that we discussed today are available out on the initiative webpage. Again, we will be extending the comments deadline, so we will communicate that new deadline um, in a future notice. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us at ISO Stakeholder Affairs at kaiso.com. And then just my last item before we close out the meeting, I just want to remind you to uh, register for the 2022 Stakeholder Symposium. Um, our early bird rate closes on August 15th, so if you haven't registered already, please be sure to take advantage of that. It will be on November 9th and 10th this year in um, downtown Sacramento at the Safe Credit Union Convention Center. And then also we are offering sponsorship opportunities, so those are also available to you if you're interested. Um, you can learn more about those opportunities by going to our website um, and then going to the Stay Informed tab and then our Stakeholder Symposium page. Um, but that's it, and uh, thank you all for joining us, and have a great rest of your afternoon. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.